Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Anthony Walker. Uh, I run a local investment brokerage company called Buckingham Investments. Uh, we've been around for 61 years this year. Obviously not me, personally. <laughs> I took the company over in 2017. Uh, but we're all about having people learn, plan, and invest in investment properties, mostly apartment buildings right here in the local area. Uh, I'm also the Chair of Student Relations with BLMU Real Estate Advisory Council. So you'll probably see me all the time if you go to the panel discussions or other, you know, React sponsored events. I like to go to that kind of stuff. And then I do this class every semester. So for the certificate program, this is kind of the foundational uh, class for that. I had to reschedule it from a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> so I apologize for that. But this is kind of the building blocks of what you need to know across commercial and investment real estate and just kind of some broad topics. I do want to try and give you some like real information you can use. So um, we'll go over some super high level basics, strategy, philosophy, what makes real estate attractive, all that kind of stuff. And then we will get into some specifics. I've got a little example deal to go over with you um, and, you know, small group today. So feel free to stop me, ask questions if something's not making sense. This probably doesn't go the full three hours, but it just depends you know, what questions you have. I'll usually do a break after an hour or so, and then we'll get into the case study. Uh, so a little bit about me. <clears throat> I was uh, originally from Minneapolis, grew up there, moved here to LA in 2000. Can't believe that was 24 years ago now, uh, to go to undergrad. And I went to SC for undergrad. I came here for grad school after uh, being in the auto insurance industry for almost 10 years. So at the same time I was there, I, I came here to figure out what kind of business I could open for myself because I didn't want to work for a giant corporation for the rest of my life. Uh, and I came to the LMU MBA program, which was awesome, by the way. So if you're an undergrad and you're thinking about an MBA, I highly recommend it. Um, and I wanted to figure out what kind of business to open. I took a real estate investing class here when Dr. Manning was uh, still teaching it and really liked that. So I thought, great, I'm going to do this. I want to invest in buildings and find a way to create a business that is scalable and delivers passive income and then freedom to do what I want with my life, right? That's what everybody wants. So that's why I got interested in real estate. Um, through another student that I knew here at that point, I got introduced to a company called Buckingham Investments. And originally I was a client, actually. Um, let's see what I started with. Yeah. So uh, I bought my first little duplex while I was a student here uh, in the MBA program with them. And kind of learn their whole model. The whole, the brokerage's whole method is all about teaching people how to invest in real estate and then helping them get started. Uh, and I really liked that. So I had a great experience as a client. I got my real estate portfolio started while I still had my W-2 job uh, in the corporate world. And uh, I thought, well, if, I'm, if, I, if I could be good at this, maybe I could be an agent uh, with Buckingham and help people buy properties, invest in properties. And if I'm really good at it, I could make enough money where I could accelerate the growth of my own portfolio. Uh, which is what I've done. So uh, that's been almost 15 years now. Uh, this slides out of date. I have 22 buildings now, 22 properties, about 175 units, uh, mostly apartment buildings uh, and three retail commercial buildings as well in Torrance. Um, so it's been a good ride. I will admit I had excellent timing, <laughs> but uh, I think actually now it's pretty analogous to around the time when I started as far as market cycles go. So um, I was privileged to take over as CEO uh, seven years ago, and I've been kind of modernizing the company's, you know, platform, our offering, our educational materials. I teach seminars and stuff like this all the time to um, potential investors and clients as well. So uh, this is a lot of the same kind of stuff that we use every day in our business, which also maybe that makes it interesting to you guys because you can see what's really going on. And that's been a great complimentary business to me. So I have a brokerage business for my day job, my active income. And then uh, as much as I can, I will take my business income and use that to buy apartment buildings. And that's my retirement plan. So uh, a lot better than 401k. They don't offer pensions anymore. <laughs> that's me with my little girls. They're a little older these days, but they still cry for photos. Uh, <laughs> so uh, today we'll talk about kind of real estate investing fundamentals in general. Uh, I'm happy to send this to anybody who, who wants it. There's a lot of good stuff in here. We also have a whole bunch of free downloadable content on our website that is just educational focused. It's not just a sales pitch. 
Although you might get a call from somebody in our office if you make some some downloads or you call in. Um, the, what really sets our company apart is, like I said, from the from the beginning of the 1960s, uh, we were founded by a guy named Jack Buckingham. That's the name. Uh, and he invested in, in real estate. He was an aerospace guy. He invested in real estate in the El Segundo area, actually like right around here, really, um, in the 1960s. And he retired when he was 30 years old. So, um, but he believed there was no good representation for buyers. Basically, and this, I don't know why, but it still remains the case. Most brokers only want to talk to property owners and try and get them to sell their property, get the listing. If you get the listing, during most markets, it's kind of a guaranteed paycheck, not these days, uh, which we can talk about if you have questions. Uh, but it allows you to you know, promote your services, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's kind of a typical brokerage model. Buyers are generally handed off to the junior agents and they get crap service, for lack of a better term. So he thought if we can be great representatives for buyers, teach people how it works, invite them into the business and help them make money, they'll be clients for life. Uh, and that's how it's worked out for us. So we kind of repackage all this kind of stuff. So uh, strategically thinking about real estate as an investment versus other things. Um, a lot of people only are ever taught that, well, there's the stock market, right? And that's what you can do. You can do mutual funds, you can do bonds, you can do stocks, maybe private equity if you want to get fancy. You can go buy a company yourself, buy a job in a lot of cases. Uh, and a lot of people forget real estate. It's gotten a lot more popular in the last 15 years. Uh, there's been some changes in the laws that allow a lot of people to invest in real estate, even with smaller down payments. And the syndication business sort of really took off over the last 15 years, which is a different topic. But generally, super high level, whether you're investing in buying your own building or whether you're investing in a fund or a syndicated deal, real estate has some amazing advantages uh, for an investor and some disadvantages too. So the big advantages are it, it's a hard asset. So you, you're buying something physical, which is rare. So, you know, that would be like gold or whatever, a company with assets, equipment, whatever. Great thing about real estate is it's a hard asset. And on top of that, you have total control over the asset, especially if you own it directly yourself. You can do whatever you want to your property. You can remodel it. You can change how it's financed. You can upgrade it, you know, rent it for more. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can 1031 exchange it, all these things. Um, and it's pretty easy to understand. So if you're, if you're looking at stocks, you're trying to understand what's going on behind the scenes at a company that you don't work at. So you can read their 10K, uh, you can listen to the news about them and you'll get the sales pitch from the executive team. Uh, and you won't really know a whole lot about what's going on in the company. They publish their financials, sure, but we, do you really know? Probably. Uh, with real estate, very easy. There's really nothing to it. It's just a simple business, uh, but a lot simpler than most businesses. You can kind of understand due diligence without even having a whole lot of experience. We can show you today with pretty much everything that's involved in figuring out how to do due diligence on a real estate deal. They're pretty much all gonna operate basically the same with some variance, depending on what's on the site, what businesses are there, what tenants you have, physical stuff, condition, all that kind of thing. So I really like that. <laughs> and you get multiple sources of return. So unlike in putting your money in a savings account, whatever, bond portfolio, with real estate, you get four elements of return, which is really attractive. Uh, you get great principal growth, and you should be able to outperform the market in a lot of cases doing real estate without taking on a whole lot of risk. Um, it's got that beautiful passive income potential. That's what gets a ton of people interested in real estate to begin with. That's what certainly what got me interested in, in it. It's a perfect retirement vehicle. You can build a portfolio over time and your retirement can be chilling and keeping your buildings and living on the cash flow or doing whatever you want to access the money. Uh, very flexible that way, but also you have a really high potential for the growth of the principal and you have the ability to force the growth of your principal as well. So that's pretty exciting. And then highly localized kind of disjointed markets, for lack of a better term, is sort of one of the last places, and they're trying, but it's one of the last places where there's a lot of market inefficiencies. Uh, so if you think about like the publicly traded markets, right? If you buy, you're buying a stock, the price for that stock on any given day is the price investors are willing to pay across the whole world and they can invest in that stock on an exchange, right? That's true of REITs for publicly traded real estate. 
But for <clears throat> little private deals that you own yourself or kind of private equity type deals, that's not the case. Uh, for the most part, you know, a, a deal is available to participants that are in that market that know that little local area that have relationships with the broker uh, and want to get into that market. So it's really fragmented, which can allow some major advantages to buyers that understand the local situation better than somebody out of the area that doesn't understand it. So it's really one of the last places where you can sort of exploit inefficiencies like that. Um, I can remember one of the things uh, Chris Manning used to tell us, it's it's not only is it inefficient, but like insider trading is perfectly legal, right? Which is, it sounds illegal, but it's not, right? It's, pr it's pretty funny. This happens in our office all the time. We treat them almost like baseball cards, properties, right? Like, well, I'll own for a while. Maybe I want to exchange it. Maybe you have some, but oh, you want to buy it? Cool. We'll just, you know, do the little deal. It doesn't need to go on the market or whatever, you know, super common for stuff like that to go on. Totally legal. Uh, and that can result in very good deals sometimes. That can result in deals nobody else knows about, right? Um, so kind of exciting there. Um, and also great financing options, uh, especially with residential real estate. Disadvantages, the main one is the lack of liquidity. <clears throat> Probably all heard this about real estate investors, asset rich and cash poor. That describes pretty much every real estate investor. You get addicted to the deal and you want to buy everything you can possibly afford. You mortgage them all and you end up with no cash, which is the right place to be when things are going well. But when things are not going well, that can become a big problem for you, which is definitely presenting itself for a lot of people right now in the market. Very interesting time to be watching this stuff. Uh, there's a management burden as well. So it's not like buying Bitcoin or stuff in gold in a safe or even buying a stock, right? You, if you own property directly, it's your responsibility what's going on at the property. You have to make sure it's rented. You have to make sure the expenses are in line. Yeah, to keep track of the debt and what's going on in the local market. And when it rains like, you know, holy heck, like it did a few weeks ago, you're going to get leaks everywhere and you have to deal with that, right? Uh, you can hire management to do that, but at the end of the day, it's still your responsibility. It's relatively complex. Understanding it and how the pieces fit together, your local market, your building can take a little bit of time to learn, but really not that difficult, but it's obviously, you know, quite a bit harder than buying Bitcoin on Coinbase or something like that. Uh, and a pretty high barrier to entry for, in most cases. If you think about your traditional real estate purchase, you're putting at least 25% of the purchase price down to buy the property. You know, a starter property in the LA area is typically a million bucks or so, right? So there's 250 grand right off the bat. There's a lot of investors out there that don't have 250 grand just to start. Now there's other ways to do that. You know, there's syndicated deals, there's funds you can invest in, invest in. There's publicly traded REITs, you can partner up with people. There's certainly a lot you can do. There's owner-occupied financing to um, lower the down payment too, but generally a lot harder than putting hundred bucks on Fidelity somewhere, right? So you have to think about that. Uh, but the returns are amazing. So, you know, leveraged real estate generally is gonna return you somewhere between 15 and 30% annually, really without taking on a ton of risk. I think my portfolio has been around 30% return during the life of my portfolio. So uh, really great. Compare that to you know the S and P or bonds or mutual funds, and we beat it hands down. Uh, if you do value add real estate or anything like that, it can be way higher. So I mean, I frequently see deals with triple digit returns in the first year. Very common. Uh, so it's a little bit about just the super high level stuff as you think about getting into real estate. Now within real estate, we have different types of buildings that you can invest in. And uh, the industry generally refers to them as asset classes. So um, it's just a fancy term for a type of commercial real estate, basically. Uh, so you have residential real estate, which can also be commercial real estate, because that's confusing. But the lending uh, industry looks at five unit and above apartment buildings as commercial real estate, because they think of you then as being in the business of providing residences to people, being a housing provider, right? One to four unit properties are generally considered residential lending. So there's a difference between the, what the lending market considers commercial and what us as investors consider commercial, kind of confusing. Uh, but you know, residential real estate is probably the easiest one to get started on. You, you know, opportunity for great returns, uh, really great value appreciation over the decades, uh, fantastic tax shelter, uh, really easy to get tenants, uh, you know, everybody needs a place to live, right? So an apartment unit that's vacant when it's priced right and it's listed right, which is not very hard to do, 
it's going to fill. It just will. Um, <clears throat> very simple. Disadvantages, that's pretty management intensive. So uh, you've got tenant turnover issues, you've got rent payment issues, you know, you got people beating your units up, uh, all kinds of stuff like that, right? Uh, definitely been a challenge the last few years, years there. Um, but this is generally a really good place to start. It's probably the easiest place to start. Lower money down options there um, and, and less cash required to own. And then you have improved commercial and industrial real estate. So this would be that kind of traditional commercial real estate you might think of. Uh, companies that are big in this space would be like CBRE, JLL. Um, they do brokerage and property management and ownership. And then you have big ownership companies that do this kind of stuff too. We have some of those people in the, in the REACT as well. Big advantage is there is you get super long-term leases <laughs> guaranteed by often really top credit tenants. So very predictive cash flow, limited management required. Uh, there's something called a triple net lease where basically the tenant pays all the expenses for the building. So it's practically like you have no management burden at all once you get a tenant in there. Very nice. Um, very consistent returns can, and they can be pretty good on appreciation too. Generally not as much as residential, but the disadvantages there are uh, the tenants are really hard to find sometimes. Those properties are very, very location um, specific and the tenants are super picky about where they want to be. So vacancies can be really long, can take a lot of money to fill them. Uh, it's, it's an expensive game. Doing commercial and industrial, you have to have a lot of capital to make that work. And the financing is not as good, especially right now. If you're looking for a loan on an office property, forget it. Not there. <laughs> SBA, that's it. Start a business and take 51% of the square footage. Uh, and then you have the riskiest and potentially highest return uh, in the stack, which would be development, unimproved land, right? You can just buy dirt and uh, you can do that a few ways. You can you can buy dirt, sit on it, land bank it, sell it when it goes up in value, but it's of course sort of like the blackjack table really. Uh, you can buy dirt and get it entitled to build something and then there's value in your approved plans. That's a pretty common strategy. We see a lot of that in our office these days. Um, and you can buy dirt and build on it and resell, right? Do the development full cycle. The advantage is there are literally no management at all. You put up a construction fence, you know, that's it. Maybe you got some people squatting on your land, but unless you get a code violation, you might not even care. Uh, you can get super high appreciation on that. So if it happens to be in the path of progress or it's the right area or a stadium gets built next door and you, nobody knew about it, you can do really, really well there. Uh, and this is just generally gambling. Super, super speculative. You know, people buy that stuff because they feel like you know, this is the next big spot. I just know it, you know. And there's zero financing available for that whatsoever because raw land generates zero cash flow. <laughs> there's nothing you can do with it, right? So not a lot of people get started buying unimproved land. I focus mostly on apartment buildings, residential real estate with a little bit of like retail and commercial stuff mixed in there too. Um, question on this, on, on the asset classes, yeah. How would, like, what factors would influence how you choose where to buy unimproved land? Oh, great question. So the question was, what factors would impact where you would choose to buy unimproved land? So the zoning is the biggest one. What the city, that's highly involved with what the city wants to do with various parcels and areas. So there's always some sort of zoning on anything. If you buy land in the middle of the desert that's, like, zoned agricultural, might not be a great investment. Probably will never be a great investment, right? Uh, but if you buy land that's zoned for allowing a lot of uses and it's in a good area, you can do well. Mostly it's a game of guessing where that local area is going in terms of other developments happening, you know, big employers moving into the area, people moving into the area. Real estate becomes worth more money when there are more people. Right. So that's kind of the game. So add on to that, either a city that you can tell is a growing city or a city that's already established, but focusing on more of like the suburban area. Around. Yeah, or even a great piece of infill land can be a good development play too. Uh, you know, it, it's I'd say it's also highly dependent on what you're seeing in a policy standpoint from the city. Like LA has done all kinds of stuff to encourage higher density and affordable housing development. And so if you were paying attention to the politics and you got your hands on a parcel of land in the middle of LA that was close to transit, you might have 
zoning that allows much more density than maybe the previous owner realized or something like that. Or maybe that, maybe some new laws pass while you own it that suddenly allows triple the density that it used to, instant value when something like that goes on. So a lot of people that are buying that stuff are paying a lot of attention to what's going on in the local political environment, what's going on at the city level, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I would say generally you're correct. Yeah. Other questions on asset classes, types of properties, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Have you had a good, an improved land before in your portfolio or is that? Yes, yeah. I've done it. Um, we, I, I bought a piece of land in Las Vegas years ago, many years ago. <laughs> over 10 years ago at this point. And it was zoned for uh, church use only, but we suspected that we could get it entitled for residential, for a small residential subdivision. So we bought the land and we went through the uh, re-entitlement process and got it entitled for a little residential subdivision and parceled it off and threw the lot lines, you know, on paper only. We did zero improvement to the actual land and we sold that to a developer to build homes. On the land, and we made a little bit of money from that. It's only paperwork, right? Yeah. So that was kind of interesting because it, it was simple, right? And that was basically a flip that happened over the span of less. How did you know? Like, what? Did, how did you know you were going to be able to flip that? Was that something like you had been paying attention to the local politics, so you started looking for uh, church zone? We, we talked to the city. It wasn't, you know, necessarily that we knew. No, I don't think anything had changed about that parcel. Right. I think the previous owner just hadn't taken the time to go through the planning process. Right. And do it. Um, so that you know, it, it, there's some hearings and applications you have to you know do and the drawings and submissions and impact studies and stuff like that. Definitely easier than Las in Las Vegas than. Los Angeles. Um, and so it was a pretty straightforward process for us. You know, we just hired an architect, got the plans drawn up, got it approved. It took, I think it probably took six to eight months, something like that. And once it's there, it's a lot more attractive to a developer because they save money on not just the plans, but they save money on time right. waiting for that to happen. So we resold it to them. They knew what they could build already. It's already approved. Now it's by right. They could build, I think it was nine homes. So it was not a big parcel. Uh, but that was, it was pretty straightforward and, you know, you can do the due diligence for that, get a general idea of that in escrow. Right. You can call an architect, you can go to the city and the planner can give you an idea if they'll never say yes. <laughs> so you're taking some, some risk and right. say, well, we would be supportive right. or something like that is generally like the, the language right. that they'll use. Uh, so we kind of went through that process. It looked like it was going to work and it worked. Yeah. Not a ton of money though. Yeah. Right there, you know, like we made compared to like doing all the work and building it, it was pocket change. Right. But that's fair. We didn't do much. Yeah. You know, it's pretty... do you think you talked at some point about commercial real estate moving forward and where it's going as far as especially like office real estate and yeah. retail and it's yeah. doing so poorly? And right. I've had a, we've had other speakers come through mm -hmm. talking about I just have to like the maturity of all of leverage and exposure mm -hmm. heading our yeah, way. Definitely. Um, and what the thought is these days, like, are people going to wait around for stuff to collapse and then right. snap it up? Or yeah. they, you know, I don't hear a lot of good things about like converting office space yeah. into residential. Right. You know, like no one seems that it thinks not. that's that easy it's or not. feasible. Yeah. Um, what do you think will happen there? Are you trying to divest out of that? Is your company trying to get out of commercial? Uh, no, you know, it, it, it's a great question. It's anybody's guess. We're already in it, uh, you know. Okay. So the maturities on those loans, depending on the property type, some of those loans were originated many, many years ago and are, have balloon payments coming due over the next few years. A lot of these loans were originated, you know, in the pandemic and they got super low rates and they're the most typical commercial lending terms you see are fixed for three, five, or seven, or 10 years. Um, and so not there's not always a balloon payment at the end of the fixed period. A lot of times it just rolls to an adjustable rate. Um, but right now we're experiencing deals that are, say, rolling from 4% to 9.5% and going from interest only to fully amortizing, which can be impossible you know, to keep making the payments. And that distress has started to show up over the past year. So we've had some of those resets already come through. Some of the really large office properties have already had maturities that were not able to be paid off at all. Some of those properties have gone back to the banks. Um, but it's kind of a story of like where you are in the asset class. 
the properties that I own that are retail and office are very small compared to what you read in the news. Um, I have three buildings. One is 10,000 square feet, one's 11,000 square feet, one's 12,000 square feet. Obviously large compared to like a house, but this is not the US Bank Tower we're talking about, right? <clears throat> that building I think sold for a third of its last sale price in 2017. So really bad, right? My buildings, I plan on continuing to own them. I have good tenants. I've got like a restaurant on the bottom floor of one of them, you know, and they do, they do well. But I think like small retail, neighborhood retail, grocery anchored retail, a lot of retail is doing very well. It's highly location dependent though. Right. Um, the big, big problems are in central business district office, right. like class A or class B office, I would actually say. So <clears throat> older office buildings built in the 1980s that are particularly large are, like you mentioned, difficult or impossible to convert to residential because they don't have enough windows, plumbing, elevators. The floor plates are just way too big right. to convert to residential effectively. Much older office buildings are, uh, strangely, are easier to convert to residential. The, the older? The much older ones right. are easier because they're generally more chopped up. They're right. in smaller suites. And if you have like older buildings that have, the only way they could get like ventilation into it was an interior atrium or something right. that can make a really attractive apartment building. right same thing with like you know these artist loft conversions and stuff those are generally on much older properties right but the, the your classic like 1980s glass right. mid to high rise is doing horribly right now uh like class a plus office is doing well so the, the very nicest office properties are attracting the nicest tenants who still feel like they need that right. space uh, but the other stuff is not. And yeah, as we see those loans continue to mature, um, that market will continue to take a beating. It, it's already just way, way, way down. There's no financing available there at all. Those properties are worth, you know, a third to a half of what they were pre-pandemic. The problem there is like the inclination as an investor is to think it's on sale, so it must be a good deal for me. <clears throat> right. And although you might be buying it at a discount compared to where it was, if you can't fill the building with tenants, it's still a bad deal, you know? Right. <laughs> so we'll see where that goes. You know, the office convert, the residential conversion is not a viable option. What do you do with it? You need to charge next to nothing and rent it as office, but you still need office tenants to want to lease it from. Uh, or you need to be able to tear it down and build something else. And then to tear down a high rise is expensive. So it's better to own dirt at that point than the building. Right. In some cases, the dirt might be worth more with no building on it. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's not exactly that part of the business I don't do much in. And like my, my business is like two to 30 unit apartment buildings and small and medium sized office and retail. And I get calls weekly now from clients saying, oh, office is doing horribly. I would like to buy a 3,000 square foot office building, please, at 50% discount. And you go on the market and those deals are not there yeah. because those deals do fine. Right, right. You know, you get owner, user, tenants, or whatever, dentists, especially medical office does really well, you know, but like small little neighborhoods, those businesses still need space. Right. Um, it's not super expensive, like high visibility, we seeing, you know, with a parking garage, it's 40 bucks a day. It's not that stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see where that goes and how bad it gets. Most of that debt is maturing this year. This year is the biggest load of, right. of all that debt that's maturing. And then next year, there's a huge chunk as well. In multifamily, we have that issue going on too, because everything got super cheap in the pandemic. Office was already in trouble as soon as the pandemic broke out, right? Because as soon as it broke out, everybody went home to work. Right. And <clears throat> lenders were cautious about office immediately, even after the pandemic broke out, because they were unsure about the future viability of the business. Multifamily is the opposite. So the office problems were exacerbated by what was happening in the fundamentals, which is a different animal than what's going on in multifamily. Multifamily, the fundamentals are great. We don't have enough housing supply, especially in LA. Um, but we had all this cheap debt that came out and everybody wanted to get into real estate investing once everything was free. So you have all of these properties that were purchased with adjustable rate, well, arms that are adjusting three years after the loan was originated or five years after the loan was originated. So everything, if you think about the time, everything got super cheap in like summer of 2020. 
right. the three year loans that were originated between then and the end of 21, early 22 are all either resetting or have reset now. And then now the five year money is going to start coming in. It's going to start resetting in 2025. Uh, so if you were able to get rents up a ton or you have enough cash to pay those down, you can refinance them. Right. But even with multifamily where occupancy is good and rent growth has been good, uh, we have owners that are in trouble. Because it, it's going to go like they got it for like two, three percent. Yeah. Back then and now right. it's going to jump to like seven and nine. Percent, right. Something like that. Fuel pencil is great at three and a half percent. Right. Not so much at night. Yeah. Eight and a half, whatever. Right. Right. And suddenly overnight, your building, which is full of paying tenants at market rent and has no problems, right. can't pay the mortgage anymore. And you can't raise rent that quickly in LA. No, uh, definitely not in Los Angeles itself because they have super strict rent control and they had a moratorium on rent increases for four years. But even the, in the rest of California, you have statewide rent control, which is a milder version. You can raise rents by five to 10% right. a year, depending on CPI. But it's not even about like getting the tenants to market, that's generally doable because you can do cash for keys, you can upgrade the units and all that. Right. You know, if you get it all the way to market and you execute on your business plan, in my experience, most of those owners are fine <clears throat> and they're getting out of it. But it can be a situation where people bought a building where rents were already at market. They borrowed 70, 70 to 75% of the purchase price and maybe they've continued with their increases, but now the building just does not support that level of debt anymore at all. Right. And those people are going to be forced to sell. So I think multifamily is not going to be as distressed as office because in most cases, there's still equity there. Values of multifamily are down about 20%. So if you put 25% down and it went up probably, I mean, from the beginning of 2020, it went up 20 to 30%, in some cases even more, you're kind of back where you started. So you could do an equity sale, take your down payment back, get mad at, about it and, and walk, but you're probably not facing foreclosure. Right. There are some deals where <clears throat> people didn't get the business plan done, where they got over leveraged, they're in big trouble. And there's deals in other markets that are in big trouble because a lot of other markets have major competition from new supply coming online that we don't have as much of that going on. And they have a much softer rental market, higher vacancy rates and their ability, the fundamentals are not in as good shape in some of the Texas markets and stuff like that, right. Phoenix and areas of that, which got very popular during the pandemic. So I uh, super long answer to your question, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, office is definitely where the worst of it is right now. Retail's doing pretty well, industrial's on fire. You know, uh, it's they, they're building the heck out of industrial, so it's kind of evening itself out, but I think industrial will be fine because the e-commerce boom. Multifamily on a fundamental basis should be fine, but people that got in trouble with the debt are going to be in for a rough one. Would you recommend that people just start getting into real estate and that kind of thing? Avoid commercial when they're out looking for jobs or where to get their hookups? Uh, yeah. That might be too big a question. I them. mean, it depends where the job is. You know, um, brokerage is rough right now. Really rough. Uh, transaction volume is down between... 50 and 80 to 90 percent depending on your market right so if you're coming in as a new entrant to that business and you've got competition from all these brokers that are now fighting for a smaller pie it's very very difficult to get started unless you can differentiate <clears throat> we're doing decently well but you know our company's way down in volume too that's just how it is um I think, yeah, if you're going into like asset management or something like that, and you're in those categories, it's a shrinking business right now, but these things can be relatively short-lived. And then if you're there and you learn the business and you get through the, you see what the tough times look like, you're really well positioned for the way back up. That's kind of the way I started. <clears throat> I started in 2010 and right. we were still like, right. we were, I, I mean, I caught the falling knife, right. as they say on the way down. So, I mean, there was no financing available at that time. Nobody wanted to own real estate at all. At that point, everybody thought, well, real estate's just dead forever and it's never going to be good again because of the great financial crisis. Um, and so I had a very difficult time when I started, but by the time the upswing was underway in 2013 was kind of when it started picking back up again. I had a few years of experience under my belt and I was way ahead of other brand new people jumping in and, and 
that propelled me right. forward and I did pretty well. Definitely the first few buildings I bought went down in value after I bought them and then went back right. up, you know, later. So it's not about timing the market, you know. I don't know. I think it's a good time to get into it, but yeah, you, you could be facing layoffs if you're in the wrong right. <laughs> you know, space. I think most of that damage has been done. Same thing could be said with loan brokerage. Yeah. There's just so little volume in financing right now. It's probably tough to get into that business. But generally, it's a great business. All right, so uh, moving on to the finance 101 section of things. So when you're in real estate investing, you're playing with time value money. Anybody take finance already? Pretty much everybody, cool. So you see, right? This is what goes into a financial calculator. You can do this in Excel, you can do this on paper, whatever. Um, whatever in any investing, you're manipulating this equation. So you have to understand it. So we kind of teach our clients this stuff. Most people never learn this in school at all. If you don't take business school, you've never seen this before, which would blow your mind. We should teach it in high school, but we don't. Also known as the compound interest formula. This is the most powerful force in finance, right? A little bit of money invested today grows on itself and over a long enough time period, this curve of my cocktail napkin graph starts to go vertical and you make way in the future a bunch. And the reason is, is because time is in the exponent of this equation, right? Your future value is worth your sum invested today times one plus the rate of return you're able to achieve on the investments to the power of N, where N is the number of years it compounds. So by far, you want your money working for you as long as possible. And then, yeah, we want to maximize your returns. But way more important than that, than that is how long your money is working for you. So if, if you're an undergrad right now, your age is your biggest asset going for you. You might feel like you have no money to invest and you want to get in today. And oh my God, how do I do it? Just start is my recommendation. Because by far, this is on your side. I didn't start till a little later out of school. I wish I had started earlier. Still got a pretty relatively early start and you'd be amazed how fast time flies. Uh, so it's super powerful. We can unpack that a little bit as it pertains to real estate, but I always like to show that. Um, if you play with this on a table, if you're daydreaming a little bit, you're doing your vision board, you see how powerful this can be. We have present value of 200 grand. If you save up 200 grand for your first investment and you buy one property and you can average a return on equity of say 25%, which looks ridiculous, but it might not be. I'll show you how. In 10 years, your 200 grand is worth $1.8 million. That's a lot of money. Still not enough to retire on these days. But in another five years after that, it triples to 5.6. And in another five years after that, it triples again to 17 million. So that it, from the 19th to the 20th year, I think this, this goes up by $2 million. So waiting a year, you gave up $2 million. If you're trying to find the best deal or time the market to the exact bottom, generally not a great idea. So I just like to hammer the time value of money stuff home. Get, get, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Uh, so for us, we help our clients with just a super basic investment plan that includes your goals. A lot of people don't even bother to think about their goals. They just say, I want to make money. Okay, but why? And what are you using it for and when, right? So that includes your general plan once you have your goals. So your time frame, what you're going to do to get there. Your detailed plan would be your goals, step-by-step -step real estate transactions, estimates every year of what you're going to be worth, um, what your properties are doing, follow up and change them and review the goals as necessary. Really, if you only did number one and number two, you'd be fine. It's honestly like the detailed plan is great, but as soon as you're actually in it, it's never gonna go exactly the way you plan it to go. So I don't know, uh, number one and number two are better. You could take just the time value of money equation and turn that into a work problem and you would have a one sentence general investment plan for real estate that looks just like this. I'm gonna invest, present value dollars for n years in real estate investments at a sustained rate of return of r percent and be worth future value dollars at the end of the plan. Just that sentence. That can be your whole plan. And if you think about it, you already know this number. I'm going to invest present value dollars, right? That's your limited resources, whatever you have earmarked to put away towards your real estate investment plan. You might have a pretty good idea of how long you would like that to be until you want to achieve your goal. And your goal is right here, future value. What's your goal for your equity position, your real estate portfolio? From there, we can solve for R and say, okay, if I have <laughs> 200 grand and I want to do this in 10 years and I want to be worth 
1.8 million, I need to make how much R percent, and we can solve for that on a financial calculator or on our little financial calculator on paper. And you can see I need to make a 25% return on my money to do that. So knowing that, I would only select investments that I think are going to generate me a 25% return. And voila, you've just narrowed the playing field a whole bunch. Now you know what sort of deals you're looking at. You have a target to hit when you're doing underwriting on stuff. It's stupid simple, but it really works this way. And if you don't think about it, you're just shooting in the dark and you're kind of like wondering what you're trying to accomplish. You could do it another way. You could say, I think I could probably make a 20% return on my money. I want to be worth $2 million. How long is it going to take me to get there? And again, you can plug that into your financial calculator or Excel. 20 years, we have 200 grand, 20% return. We wanted to go to 2 million. It's going to be somewhere just between 10 and 15 years. I'm guessing it's going to be in year 13, just looking at the chart, right? Something like that. Obviously, you can get the exact answer. But really useful to just think about it like this and write it down because that's actually going to guide your thinking and guide your investment selection. I cannot tell you how many people come into our office saying, my cousin got rich investing in real estate. Can you do that for me? You know, and that's it. That's And that's cool because that's all they've thought about it, but they've never thought about what that looks like for them, what they need to feel financially independent, when they want it, what they use the, want to use the money for, what their risk tolerance is, what their willingness and time is available to manage the buildings or whatever, right? What their cash availability is. All these are questions you need to ask yourself as you're getting into this, not just send me your best deals, please, because that might not, that might not work for you. I could send you amazing, an amazing deal that doesn't qualify for any debt and takes 500 million after purchase to make any money on it. And if you don't have that in the bank, it's not a good deal for you, you know? Uh, so you gotta think about this stuff. Here's the uh, elements of a detailed plan. This part, you know, again, this is gonna change all the time, but uh, for the sake of the class, your financial goals, market value, gross equity, and income estimates on a year-by-year -year basis. So you could estimate and chart this stuff out in Excel. It's never gonna go exactly the way you expect it to, but this helps you in kind of modeling out your future and the realistic, uh, what you can realistically expect it to do for you. Cash account, tax account, net of both accounts, and then you know financial parameters across the plan. I usually don't bother to get this fancy because it changes so quickly. And then this is a super important one. Uh, let me move our Zoom window. Oh, that's somebody else. Um, exit strategies. So this is a big question I get from people all the time on um, investing in real estate. Because it's illiquid and because there's significant tax consequences, it's, oh, how do you, okay, fine. You made all this money. You have this giant equity position. You've invested in real estate for decades. That's awesome. What do you do? How do you get the money? How do you get out of the deal and sail off into the sunset, right? On your mega yacht. <clears throat> well, you have a few options, um, but it, it can get pretty complicated. So number one, sell everything and pay the taxes. I do not recommend that option. You can easily get yourself in a position where you're paying more taxes than you get from the proceeds of the sale because of the way taxation works on exchanges. Uh, but sometimes it's necessary and depending on your situation and your tax situation, everybody's different. There's still a lot of people that just sell, take the money, do what they're going to do. You can own it for passive cash flow. Um, I don't know if we're able to move that window at all, but that'd be great if we can. Um, this is what most people want to do. So you can forecast a passive cash return on equity number. It's like not on this I think it's somebody else's running it. Um, <clears throat> generally, at least in our area, you can probably make about a 5% passive cash flow on your equity at any given point in your portfolio. So that's a super important number to remember for a minute. If we go back to our plan, now I click that. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, while we figure that out, if we go back to our plan, that future value number, if that's your estimated equity in your portfolio, you could probably make about a 5% passive cash flow 
on that number. So working the math a little bit, right? We had our general plan, that one sentence plan. Take 5% of whatever that future value is, and that's probably your spendable cash flow without needing to sell anything. So you can work backwards from there. If you say, I have this extravagant lifestyle goal and I want $500,000 of passive income a year, $500,000 is 5% of 10 million. So I want my future value in my investment plan to be $10 million. Great. We've established our future value number. What do I have today? That's your present value number. Now you can play with how long it's going to take you based on what rate of return you think you might be able to achieve to get to that 10 million number, at which point you're financially independent. You can retire, you can quit your job, whatever, sell your business right off into the sunset. Super useful number to have. 5% I think is pretty good expectation in most markets with a portfolio that you've owned for a while and you've stabilized, you should be able to hit that. What is generating that passive cash flow? Rent payments? Rent. Tenants? Yeah. yeah. Rent payments from tenants right. minus your operating expenses minus your mortgage right. payment. And the really awesome thing about real estate as an investment vehicle is your income grows in your retirement because you're going to get rent increases over time. You're going to pay down your loan over time. Your expenses will rise too, but not generally as much as the rent will. Right. And especially as you pay down the loan more and more. Do you need this topic? Well, we got to get it down. Okay. Um, awesome. Uh, so this that's why it's so perfect for, for retirement. Your traditional approach to retirement for a lot of people is some fixed income for yield, some stocks, right? And you draw from your nest egg once you retire and, uh, you know, hope you die before it runs out, right? It's not a very good way to approach retirement. Right? What if we get a whole bunch of advances in medical technology and we all live to 150? I mean, right? But uh, if you do that, you're just going to be richer when you have real estate because you never actually have to sell anything. Your buildings keep going up in value over a long period of time. Your tenants keep paying more rent over a long period of time. It always goes up, right? So uh, that's a great exit strategy. Basically, don't exit is that strategy. Yes, sir. Is that 5% annual return? That's annual. That's right. Yeah. And that's going to vary widely. For a lot of people, when you get into your first investment, that's not going to be 5%. It depends what you buy, where you buy, how much work it might need, what kind of project it is, what asset class you're in. These days, I'm not seeing a whole lot of 5%. Because if you're using debt, you're borrowing at six and a half. So it's pretty hard to get filed. If you're buying all cash, no problem. I don't recommend that, though, for reasons that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, another one you can do, and you can kind of combine these, is you can refinance for lump sum withdrawals. So uh, you invest for a while to the you know, kids are ready to go to college. Got to pay for that LMU tuition, and uh, you want to refi a building so you can get two hundred thousand dollars out. That's a good option for that. Generally, a cash out refinance is not a taxable event, so great way to access equity in the property or in your properties, combination thereof, without paying taxes. Very common. You can use that to buy a house, buy a business, other lump sum expenses, get a boat, whatever you want. Uh, or this was popular years and years ago, and it's back for the first time in over a decade, sell and carry financing. Anybody heard of seller financing before? Yeah, it's it's back. So you can become the bank. Uh, you can sell property. And if you own the property outright, let's say, simplest example, you have a million dollar property. Somebody puts $200,000 down on your million dollar property, but they can't or don't want to, or you want to give them a loan. For eight hundred thousand, you in, instead of them getting a bank loan, you carry back a note for eight hundred thousand. They make payments towards your note, and you make cash flow on the debt service that they pay you for buying your building. You have no more tenants to deal with. You don't own the property anymore. Don't call me when it rains and leaks. That's your problem. But mortgage payment is due on the first, <clears throat> so you better pay. And if you don't, I'll just take the property back. I already know it. I can manage it myself, and then I'll sell it again to somebody else and carry that paper back, and then we'll be good. So. Uh, Popular strategy again right now. Why? Rates are way up. Yeah, suddenly you can make money doing that. The prospect of carrying paper at three percent when you're a seller is not very exciting. Uh, you know, two or three years ago, but these days you can carry at six percent, and that's pretty good yield. That's better than you can make in treasuries or wherever else, and it's collateralized against real estate. So um, you're in really good shape. Makes you go. And um, on top of that the amount that you carry is tax deferred as well. So that, that can be a good tax strategy. You don't pay tax until they pay the loan off. 
on that amount. So that was really popular decades ago in the 70s and 80s when our company was uh, growing the last time around. And it's back. Yeah, Jeff, pardon? Yeah. Um, going back to passive cash flow, is that where you, like, if you want to, like, that lavish lifestyle you mentioned mm -hmm. um, and increase your annual income, is that where you'd utilize the 1031s? Or is that just like a, a component? The, 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 I'll explain it in a minute. But yeah, the, the 1031s are a vehicle to get you there. Okay. So a 1031 allows you to move your equity from building to building without paying capital gains taxes. Mm -hmm. So if, if you go back to here, and this is a, oh, not here. Uh, this is a common question. Anyway, um, it's not realistic to expect you could invest $200,000 in one property and have that property be worth $17 million yeah. in 20 years. That is not going to happen. I suppose it's possible, but probably not. Instead, what happens is over time, it becomes necessary to scale up your portfolio and that duplex gets sold and exchanged into a four unit. The four unit gets sold and exchanged into an eight unit. All right, we're good. Um, <clears throat> and so on. So um, over time, yeah, this is a representation of, all, of a number of transactions that's going to happen during that 20 years. So that's the vehicle to get you there without paying a whole bunch of tax along the way. Yeah. Um, Questions on exit strategies. This is this is important. Yes. If the goal is like a five percent passive cash flow, mm -hmm. what makes that more attractive than someone just putting their money in a treasury bond, not having to deal with confidence and making that five percent? Perfect segue. Because the five percent cash flow is only one element of the four elements of return you get in real estate. So with the, you're absolutely right, and this is the battle a lot of people are. Uh, dealing with right now in their heads is, well, why would I bother with tenants and all this to get 5% if I get 5% from the U.S. government? Totally understandable, but when you get 5% from the U.S. government, you only get 5% from the U.S. government. That's it. The bond market may fluctuate in value and go up or down. Who knows? Uh, but when you invest in real estate, you get the four elements of return. Those combined equal your R or your rate of return, your combined rate of return on your capital. The 5% is only one of the elements of return. And you, you kind of flex your return back and forth between these different elements, depending on where you are in your portfolio's journey, your life cycle, you know, how aggressive you want to be and all that kind of stuff. So the big one with real estate that you, with real estate that you definitely don't get with treasuries is appreciation. The value of properties does tend to go up over time always. It doesn't go up every year. It's not right now. It's going down right now at least in the commercial real estate market it is. Uh, but over time, it overwhelmingly increases, and I'll show you 50-some years of values in a minute. Um, you also get equity buildup through amortization. I think I have slides on each one of these. Yeah, here we go. So appreciation, uh, increase in value over time, that's from two factors. One, inflation, the value of the dollar goes down over time. And so if you own an asset denominated in dollars, it becomes more expensive as inflation does its thing. So real estate is an excellent hedge against inflation. Wonderful thing to own during times like this. We're in an inflationary time period now for the first time in 50 years. So um, you can do really well just owning it. And then you have demand appreciation as well. So as there's more demand for the land, as more people come, as there's more jobs, we want to move to an area or whatever, you get demand-based appreciation too. So those two combined uh, conspire to lift the value of your property over time. That's really the primary way that people make a huge net worth over a long period of time owning real estate. We probably all met these people, especially in Southern California. Their families have owned properties for like two or three generations. Literally doesn't matter what they bought. Don't even need to ask. Guarantee you they were, they're worth tens of millions of dollars if they have a significantly sized portfolio, just because of appreciation happening over time and the effects of inflation and demand over time. So here's 56 years of uh, appreciation. I forgot to add 2023. Uh, 2023 ended at 496. If you can't read this in the back, this is price per square foot. I think our source is hidden at the bottom. This is price per square foot of multifamily properties from about LAX down through Long Beach, going back to 1965. So this is two units and above, duplexes to whatever, 200 units. And in 1965, the average price for those properties was 14 bucks <laughs> per square foot. 
In 2022, it was 518. In 2023, it was 496. So we are in a down market right now. Um, the height of this last cycle was the middle of 2022. And what happened in the middle of 2022? Anybody remember? Jerome Powell started a super aggressive campaign of raising interest rates. So there's some relationship between interest rates and, and value, but not not one to one. Uh, what you will notice looking at this chart is there is a nice, beautiful up and to the right trend that benefits people that have owned properties for decades. Uh, it's subject to the business cycles, so you do see some downs and some ups, but generally the downs are not only shorter, but also shallower than the ups. And so if you buy properties with a long-term mindset uh, in your head, you're gonna do well. You have to be able to own through the downturns. You don't wanna be forced to sell and lose your equity. You don't wanna give it back to the bank. So you don't wanna be so aggressive that you get yourself in trouble which is definitely happening to some people right now. But if you can hold on to stuff, the message is it's gonna be fine and you're gonna do well. On a super long-term average, our average annual rate of appreciation on this chart is six and a half percent every year. So that, that's just your time value of money math from 14 to 518. I think actually to 496, it's like 6.4 now, but it never dips below six, depending on where you are in the cycle. And sometimes I've seen it in the cells. Uh, so very, very effective owning property over time. So in addition to the, that 5% cash flow, you also get 6.5% appreciation, right? Starting to stack up. Why I showed you a chart that's in the 20s. Here it is, inflation adjusted. <laughs> so this is all in 2022 dollars. And so this is a representation of the increased demand for the real estate because we've backed out the inflation from the equation here on this chart. So you can see that over time, there's been more and more demand as well in this data set. Cash flow, very simple. You have a income statement, same thing you would use to evaluate a company, any business you might run. But with real estate, we have our own little terms on the income statement. We have gross scheduled rents, which is just the total rents that the building can generate in a year. So if you have a, a four unit apartment building that generates $1,000 per unit, that's the rent per unit. That's 4,000 a month, that's 48,000 a year. So your gross scheduled rents would be 48,000 a year. Then you have a vacancy allowance. You always wanna, you know, on your projections, allow for some vacancy because there's always gonna be some turnover. Then you have your other income. That's things, at least in apartment buildings, like laundry and parking and stuff like that. That equates to your effective gross income. After effective gross income, you subtract operating expenses. So that would be taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, Utilities, repairs, reserves, pest control, elevator, pool service, all that kind of fun stuff. Boring, but necessary. 35% is a typical ratio for operating expenses in our market here. Effective gross income minus operating expenses equals net operating income. That's one of the most important metrics you'll learn in commercial real estate underwriting. And that's the same as EBITDA. Have you taken company finance, yeah, accounting. So it's the same thing as earning before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, right? Because here's the rest. So after NOI, we call it, then we have debt service, mortgage payments. Underneath debt service, we have cash flow. So we can compare all these numbers to different parts of our um, rent roll. We can compare them to our balance sheet. We can compare them to our debt, the property's price, and all of these metrics allow you to analyze buildings, compare them to each other, and decide if you have a good deal on your hands or not. Super important stuff here. Very simple. How many words do we have here? 15 words, that's it, right? Very easy. Um, then calculating equity buildup. This is the principal pay down on your loan. So if you buy a building with debt, your tenants are paying your rent. And if you're smart, you buy a building where the rent is more than the mortgage payments so that you can keep the building. And then effectively, your tenants are actually paying your mortgage payments for you. So the part of the mortgage payment that goes to paying off principal is yours at the end of the day. If you sell your building, you don't owe that debt anymore. So it's your cash coming out. If you exchange it, you know that's going into your next deal. Uh, that's taxable and everything. You just can't spend it because it's, it's paying off your loan balance. But it goes straight to equity. So we call that equity buildup or principal pay down. And you can just use an amortization calculator to show you that. So if you've ever looked at loan amortization calculators, at the beginning, you're not paying much principal. At the end, you pay a ton of principal. That's the amortization or the principal pay down on your loan. 
divided into your equity, that is the percentage return attributable to equity buildup or principal paid out on your property. Does that make sense? Really simple, just Excel can do this for you. Uh, so our little example here, if we bought a $1.2 million property, 300 grand down, borrowed 900, you can see I made this uh, slide a few years ago because the interest rate was 4%. Uh, the interest is 29.76, monthly principal was 13.20. And so this, this principal payment is what we're talking about here, times 12 divided into your equity. That's the third element of return. The fourth element of return is tax shelter benefits. Now this is, for a lot of people, the best part about real estate. You get amazing tax treatment in real estate investing. And there's two primary tax benefits that we talk a lot about. Number one is the 1031 exchange. So we mentioned that earlier. The 1031 exchange isn't, is, is harder to quantify on like one property because what you're doing is when you sell a property, you would normally pay a long-term capital gain rate if you owned it for longer than a year. You would, today's rates is like 15% plus 10 for the state or something like that. Um, but if you do a 1031 exchange and the proceeds all go to a neutral third-party intermediary, so you, don't, you can't touch the money yourself, and you invest it into another property within 180 days, subject to a whole bunch of other rules that aren't that hard to deal with, um, you get to defer all of that gain. You don't pay any of those taxes. So that's amazing. So if you bought a building for a million bucks and you sold it for two million bucks, under normal circumstances, your gain is a million dollars. Your tax is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. A lot of money, right? If you did the same transaction, you sold the two million dollar building, you could roll all of that profit into your next purchase, no tax. Very, very effective. That's how you scale up over time, right? If we're trying to get that small number into that seventeen million, twenty, ten million, whatever. Uh, you're probably doing 10, 1031 exchanges over time to get into those buildings. Um, of the 22 buildings I have now, properties, I don't, I didn't own any of them when I started. I've exchanged over time into larger and larger properties. Sometimes you exchange, sometimes you refi and buy, sometimes you buy with new cash. But I, I try to do that in as tax efficient manner as possible. And the 1031 exchange is a huge part. Quantifying your tax shelter benefits still often boils down to the depreciation deduction. So uh, the IRS allows you to take book depreciation on your property over 27 and a half years for residential property and 39 years for commercial or industrial property. But you can only write off the improvements or the, the value and the improvements or the structure. You can't write off the land itself. Um, so every property is different in how much you can write off. So my, my go-to example is a beat up old bungalow in Manhattan Beach has very little depreciation available because all of the values in the land and a 20 story high rise in Compton has lots of depreciation available because all of the, all the building values and built. You can get really fancy with this, but you know, straight line depreciation, you offset that book depreciation against the cash flow the property generates and your cash flow becomes tax sheltered or tax free. And so we can quantify this number <laughs> as compared to non-tax sheltered investments. And that becomes part of those four elements of return or your combined R, your rate of return number on your um, on your total return. Currently, you can get super fancy with this stuff. You can do a cost segregation study, which splits all the depreciable elements into different buckets, accelerates it. You can take bonus depreciation because of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And if you are a full-time real estate professional, it becomes really easy to never pay any income tax at all. Yes. But interest is also yeah a write-off um already so that's separate from the depreciation deduction um of the debt service you, your cash flow it, it, you're you're already not paying uh in, in, any income tax on the uh, interest payments because that's coming right off uh, before you calculate the building's cash flow uh with no depreciation you would pay taxes on the principal pay down but you won't pay taxes on your interest. So that's another, I mean, that's just, any company is going to enjoy that though, right? Interest expenses always are right. Yes. With the 1031, do you only pay taxes on the appreciation of the most recent property you bought? No. So you can get yourself in trouble. So the question was, do you, with the 1031, do you only pay taxes on the most recent property that you bought? So with a 1031, if you do a fully deferred 1031 exchange, you do not pay any tax at all, first of all. So that's the goal for most people on every exchange is to not pay any tax at all. You can do a partial 1031 and take some cash out and pay some tax if you need 
money to do some, something else. But what you're really doing with a 1031 is you are shifting the basis from the property that you sold into your new property. And that follows you through that equity, your basis follows you through the investments that can, that continues to exchange into through your entire life. So my first investment was a $300,000 duplex. I don't own it anymore. I've exchanged it, it's gone. But I bought it for 300,000. Let's say I exchanged that three times and now it's a $5 million 16 unit building. If I were to sell the $5 million 16 unit building, even though I first bought a six unit and then I bought a 12 unit in between with that same equity and did two other exchanges, effectively my gain on sale is $5 million minus the $300,000 duplex that I bought. My gain on sale would be $4.7 million. And if I refinance those buildings for lump sum withdrawals tax-free along the way, it's very possible that my $5 million building has somewhere in the range of $3 million in debt on it. So I might get $2 million in cash proceeds from that sale and owe tax on $4.7 million worth of gain. And that's uh, not gonna look very good, right? So you can get yourself over a long life of investing, you can get yourself into big, big trouble. You have to be very careful about tax planning and picking which buildings to sell and when and whether you're gonna realize tax on them because you could be in a situation where you can sell a building and owe more than the proceeds you get from the sale to the government. So my recommendation is to do what we call swap till you drop, which is you 1031 exchange until you die. Because when you die, morbid, but your uh, errors get what's called a step up in basis as to the value at the time of death. So if you invest whatever, you buy the $300,000 duplex and over a very long life of real estate investing, you turn the $300,000 duplex into a $100 million portfolio, which is totally doable if you're young. Your heirs will inherit the $100 million portfolio and the basis for purposes of calculating their gain will be stepped up to 100 million. They can sell for 100 million. No capital gains. Powerful stuff. But you gotta die. <laughs> Good for your kids. <laughs> Did you have a question? I was just gonna say, so like, given that you have a successful portfolio along your lifetime, the only way you can avoid it is to buy death. Right. Yeah. Okay, so there, well, I mean, there's, there's, some, there's some very fancy other ways you can do it. Um, you could do the, you know, seller financing thing, right? And sell and carry paper. Um, you can do something called a deferred sales trust, which is a very fancy tax avoidance strategy that trustee, you know, these lawyers have set up over the years. Um, it's a scheme, you know, I'm, supposedly it's legal, but, you know, you will not be able to just sell, take the money without doing some very fancy tax planning. You can use irrevocable trusts. You have to worry about the estate taxes too, which is a separate issue from capital gains. I'm not a CPA, so you shouldn't take tax advice from me, by the way. Uh, but think, I mean, by the time you're in the 100 million you range, you've got a team of yeah. tax professionals advising you on what to do. Uh, but yeah, in its most simple form, swap till you go. Yeah. Take refis for you know lump sums when you need it live on the cash flow, or if you have to sell a building, sell one you bought with new cash. Because then you're just going to pay the gain on that building. <clears throat> Make sense? Taxation? Everybody's favorite topic. Okay. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Okay. So super important concepts here. Within these four elements of return, right? We just went over all four. There's trade-offs between them. You can't have them all be super high. Uh, you can flex your returns back and forth between them, depending on what you need out of your life at that junction. The most prevalent debate that you hear from people is the trade-off between cash flow and appreciation. There's almost no way out of this. You will make trade-offs between these two. Um, generally, the higher cash flow a property generates, the lower your appreciation or your return on equity from appreciation will be for a variety of reasons. And by the opposite ticket, the more a property appreciates or in the higher appreciation rate you tend to experience over a long period of time, the lower the cash flow will be as a percentage of the equity too. There's just that trade-off. And what that's all about is a lot of times area, building quality, asset class, time, and leverage. So all these things 
work together. If, there, if there's anything you try and put together kind of from the seminar, it, I want you to understand how interrelated all of these concepts are and that you can't just have everything. There's trade-offs in everything we do. Uh, so great example here. Here's some of our, our research from years ago. <clears throat> this, if you can't see it, is the uh, price per square foot in Manhattan Beach, and this is Hopo. So these are two markets right next to each other. <clears throat> Manhattan Beach is obviously beachfront, super expensive. Hawthorne, a little more, you know, middle of the road. 40-year um, average rate of appreciation from 1971 to 2011. And Manhattan Beach was 9%. Uh, that same rate of appreciation in Hawthorne during that time period was 6%. So you do get more appreciation generally from investing in nicer areas. And that's why a lot of people want to buy in nicer areas. Understandable, right? Maybe you get more appreciation, but there's trade-offs. Uh, still, I think I put this chart back up here to say, you know, at the same time, pretty much no matter what you buy, especially in the LA area is gonna do well over time because we have this geographical constraint on supply. There's just no more land to build on. Um, but I wanna show you the impact between these different metrics and how that works. So um, you have to understand the income metrics, how they fit together, and the impact of leverage on returns. <clears throat> so uh, this is probably, from a technical standpoint, this is probably the most important slide in the seminar, uh, if you want to take a picture or anything like that. So these are the metrics that you would need to underwrite any commercial real estate deal. These are primarily what we use every day to make investment decisions and to pitch properties, decide how to price them, all this stuff. And if you understand each one of these metrics, you're gonna understand how all those pieces fit together and you're gonna be able to make good decisions for yourself as far as your own investments go. So <clears throat> first we have the cap rate and the gross rent multiplier. Anybody heard of these before? Yeah, good. All right, so the cap rate is the net operating income divided by the price. We're gonna refer to a whole bunch. Remember our uh, little income statement? So it's just the NOI, that's the EBITDA for the property, divided by the price or the value. I put value here because cap rate is actually more useful as a valuation metric than even a pricing metric. <clears throat> really good for both. And then the GRM is the gross rent multiplier. And the math on that is price or value, same thing, divided by the gross scheduled rents. And so the difference between the two is obviously this gives you a percentage, whereas this gives you a multiple, but also with cap rates, you're using net operating income. So that's after expenses, whereas with the gross rent multiplier, you're using gross scheduled rents. So that's gross revenue. This is before any expenses. So if we take a, it's kind of hard to conceptualize this without an example. Let's take a, a million and a half dollar property. If it generates $100,000 in gross scheduled rents, we would say that the GRM on that property is 15. Math obviously makes sense to everybody, but who cares? What does that mean for me? If you think about it, 15, mathematically is the same as 15 divided by one, right? So you could say for this particular property, <clears throat> I'm paying $15 in purchase price for every $1 of annual rent revenue that the property generates. So it's kind of like a PE ratio or multiple with stocks, the lower the better. I'd rather pay 14 than 15, so you can negotiate on that. And by the same ticket, you can use this to comp buildings and decide what a good deal is. So you can look at market research and say, I'm looking at the four most relevant comparable sales for this property. They all went for a 13 times gross price. And you want me to pay 15 times gross for your property. I will pay 13. And my offer makes sense because here's the four comps. They sold at 13. You should accept my offer at 13. Seller doesn't have to say yes, but you got some good support there. 
uh, by the same ticket, if you know you do the comps and the markets that going for 16 and you've got one at 15, don't tell anybody, go buy the building, right? Because you're probably getting a better deal versus the market. It's more complicated than that, but that that is actually how value in properties works. Um, cap rate by the same ticket, it's the NOI. So this same building probably generates 65,000 NOI because um, I mentioned it briefly earlier, but uh, thirty-five percent is a pretty typical expense ratio, operating expense ratio for buildings. So off the gross, if we take thirty-five percent of this number, that, that's a pretty good estimate for the net operating income. In reality, we would probably have financial, historical financial information here, and we'd be doing due diligence and underwriting, and so we'd get the real expenses. Uh, but thirty-five percent is a good, just a good metric to use. And so on a cap rate, that's four point three percent, right? So um, this is useful because now we can compare oops, other buildings to each other that might have higher or lower expense ratios and still get a similar a comparable yield number out of them. Like one building that has a pool and an elevator versus a building that doesn't is going to have a higher expense ratio because you have to have the elevator service, you're going to have the pool service, right? Um, so that's useful for that. Cap rates also allow you to compare the different asset classes to each other. Like, you know, the expense ratio with the... Um, Income statement looks like on an industrial building is completely different than what it's going to look like on a multifamily property. But the cap rates can be compared to each other, and you can still decide um, which one you might rather buy based on the yield that the property generates. So, another way to look at cap rate is if you bought this building all cash, no debt, that's your cash flow. $65,000 is 4.3% of 1.5 million. So if you plunked down 1.5 million, you bought the building, you make 4.3% on your money. Not as good as a treasury, right? But you get those other elements of return. But another useful thing with the cap rate to think about, and this is what's stopping a lot of people from investing right now, is typical market cap rates right now range from four and a half to six. But the cost for most commercial mortgages right now is six and a half. So if this is the yield on total capital, why would you borrow at six and a half percent and go buy an asset at 4.3, right? Most people don't want to do that. So a lot of buyers are on the sidelines right now. They would like that to reinvert. Typically, you want to get a higher cap rate than your cost of funds or your interest rate. That's generally not possible right now at all. So the market's in a weird place because I think there's still a lot of demand for these properties based on what people expect them to do regarding the other elements of return versus just the yield. It's not only the cash flow that people are paying attention to. And the debt is only temporary too, right? So for people that think this is going to work itself through the system, rates are gonna be lower in a year from now, maybe you can justify that. And you borrow at six and a half today and refi at five and a half in the future. And if you bought a six cap, you're in good shape, right? But this, that math and that inversion is stopping a lot of buyers from participating in the market right now. Kind of like what I was talking about earlier. More importantly, um, I think we'll talk more about cap rates in, deal, in detail later, uh, but this is, it's like a bond yield. It's an expression of risk. So this is the yield that the property generates for you. Um, the higher the cap rate is, typically, the riskier the deal. That's just how it works. So a lot of investors have this inclination to go and just find the highest cap rate you can possibly find. That's great, but you just deliberately went out and bought the riskiest property you could possibly find. Not necessarily the best idea. Okay, so we use these two all the time to um, value buildings. Uh, the next one, very important, is the debt coverage ratio. These two are probably the most important, in my opinion. That's why I put here. Yes. Oh, the meaning of it? Yeah, sure. So the GRM, it's like a revenue multiple for a building. So the lower, the better, because if you think about it, if we have a million and a half dollar building that generates a hundred grand in gross revenue and annually, if I'm paying a million and a half for the building, effectively, I'm paying $15 for every $1 of annual recurring rent revenue. And so I would rather pay less. If you can get that dollar of recurring rent revenue for less, you got a better deal. Some people will look at this as like a payback period, like it takes me 15 years to make my investment back. That's not the right way to look at this because there's always going to be operating expenses. There's going to be debt too. That's not your payback period here. I, I get the analogy, but it's really not what it's for. It's a multiple. It's a valuation multiple. 
Um, and I, I think I've got some market data in here a little later, and you can see these metrics in real life, and that'll probably help them make a little more sense. The debt coverage ratio is what's going, that's kind of what's causing the issues in the market today um, from a lending standpoint. So the debt coverage ratio is what uh, commercial lenders use to decide how much they will lend on that on a given property. And the math is it's the net operating income divided by the debt service. So we say DCR equals NOI over debt service. The debt service is just the uh, annual mortgage payments. If you want to sound fancy, it's debt service. Um, most apartment building lenders, at least in this area, they want to see a debt coverage ratio greater than or equal to a 1.20. So if you think about this conceptually, what this means is if they want a 1.20 and of the property's income divided by the mortgage payments, they want you to have 1.20 is the same as 120%, right? They want your income, your property's income to be greater than or equal to 120% of the mortgage payments. So commercial lenders are forcing you to cash flow on your building. They want you to have a 20% pad on top of the mortgage payments and cash flow so that they know you're always gonna be able to make payments. That's what makes them more comfortable. They will only ever loan you so much, as much money as qualifies with this equation as they seek. That's how commercial loan underwriting works. They don't care if you've got 5 million bucks in the bank or you make 5 million bucks a year personally from your business, they don't care. They loan on the building. That's it, they loan on the building as an ongoing asset. Very different from a home loan, where the home loan cares a ton about how much you personally make annually. Commercial lenders lend on the buildings themselves as an ongoing business. So this is why we're talking about the office market and even the multifamily market being in trouble right now, is because when rates reset, if you think about that, that changes the annual debt service. The payment at 3.5% is way lower than the payment at 8.5%. But if the NOI doesn't change and the rate suddenly jumps to 8%, maybe this is, goes down to a 0.6 or a 0.8. So now you go back to your lender and you say, can I refi the loan please? It's reset. They say, sure, you can refi the loan. Put $2 million more down into the property to pay the balance down enough such that the debt coverage ratio is equal to a 1.2 or greater. What happens if you don't have the money? You sell the building. That's what's happening. So if there's any equity, you do an equity sale, you sell the building, hopefully you walk away unscathed, you can buy something else, something smaller. But if not, you give the keys back to the lender. That's what's going on in the office right now, is that these buildings are so vacant and not able to charge enough rent, and they, they're getting it from both sides. They got, they're in really rough shape from NOI because of the pandemic and work from home and nobody wants to lease office at the same rates that they did before. And the rates are three times what they were before. That's a great recipe for no deal when it comes to financing those, right? And then because of the systemic issues in the office market, a lot of lenders are just saying, we're not, we're not doing office right now. It's a bit, I'm sorry. And so there's no financing at all. So that's what's going on. Multifamily is different. Multifamily, generally, everything's great in NOI. In NOI country, we're good. Rents are solid, vacancies low. You know, it's easy to run the buildings, but we, we could have a problem here on the lower part of this equation, which can result in distress for ownership. <clears throat> Super important concept in commercial real estate. Uh, and then we have the mortgage constant. This is a little more uh, academic term. You don't see a lot of people use this, but it's actually, it, it's the percent of money paid each year to pay or service the debt given the total value. Yeah, do you have a question? Um, yeah, referring back to the DCR. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I didn't fully really understand that. It's better to have Higher interest rates or lower interest rates for you, the investor? Lower. Always better to have a break. Okay. Yep. Ideally, you get a little room on that. You know, if you put extra down, you're more insulated versus changes in interest rates when you need to build it. Uh, so the mortgage constant uh, is kind of a percentage as of the whole, um, both the interest and the principal as a percentage of the total value of the loan. Uh, ideally, you want that also to be uh, below your cap rate, that hasn't been possible in years in our market. 
Uh, that's just very difficult to do, but it's a, it's a good number to pay attention to. And then the leverage factor. So this is where you get that trade off between cash flow and appreciation. I'm going to explain leverage in a sec. But the leverage factor is mathematically, it's the inverse of the percentage of equity. So with 25% down, your leverage factor is four. And what that means is, tell me I put this next, I did. Uh, you multiply your return on equity from appreciation by your leverage factor when you own property. I know that sounds insane. So um, check out my little example here. Very simple. Let's say you have $500,000 to invest. You could buy a property all cash for 500 grand. I get you a condo somewhere. You were, believe, you were raised to believe all debt is bad. And if you can afford a cash, you should buy a cash. So let's buy a cash. It goes up by 5% in your average year, let's say. And so in year two, it's worth 525. Your return on equity from appreciation is the appreciation you made divided by your money in the deal. So it's $25,000, which is 5% of the purchase price divided by $500,000, which is your money in the deal. Surprise, surprise, it's 5%. That's equal to the appreciation rate in the market. Now, if instead you took the same 500 grand down, use that for a down payment and you borrow a million and a half bucks, you buy a $2 million building and we make sure that that $2 million building generates enough rent to pay the mortgage on the million and a half dollar loan, you're in good shape operationally. The $2 million building is right next to the $500,000 condo. It also goes up at 5% per year on average. 5% of $2 million is $100,000. And your return on equity from appreciation is $100,000 divided by your money in the deal, $500,000, not the purchase price, 20%. So you made 20% on your money. It's like a little cocktail napkin trick, but it actually works this way. And it, it really is this simple. This is what people don't get about real estate investing and why you would do it instead of the treasuries. Because <laughs> this is what gets your returns into the 20s. It's insane. If you think about this, 20% plus 3 to 5% cash flow plus 5% principal pay down plus tax shelter benefits, you can get returns into the 30s, 20s or 30s very easily investing in real estate without doing much crazy stuff. And if you can do that for 20 years, virtually it doesn't matter how much you start with, you're going to be doing really well. It's, it's like stupid that this isn't covered more, but this is why it works right here. That's why it works. Yes. You just have to be able to pay the loan back year by year when you realize the payments. When you realize the payments. So, exactly. So there's that trade off between cash flow and appreciation. So the more you borrow on this property, you're going to make great cash flow. There's no loan to pay, right? So whatever cap rate you buy this property at, that's going to be your cash flow. This property, especially in today's market, you're going to pay six and a half percent for that debt. Uh, realistically, this is an un, this is an unrealistic scenario that I've written here. Right now, nothing pencils with 25% down. Uh, for many years, it was totally normal to put 25% down. And most kind of typical deals would pencil with 25% down. And by pencil, I mean positive cash, breaking your better cash flow. Today, that's not possible. Today, your average deal will break even with 45 to 50% down. So what you're doing, though, by putting a bigger down payment down is you're diluting your returns. You're accepting a lower return on equity for a larger down payment. In this example, we have 100% down, so we have a super low return. But there's a middle ground between these two, right? Yes. When you say today, are you trying to see right. Yeah, in the current interest rate environment, right. Like four years ago. Like... Four years ago, this was totally different. Yeah. Uh, when was four years ago? We were right about to shut down four years ago. Uh, but yeah. For most of the last uh, 15 years, you've been able to break even or better with 25% down. And then follow the question. Is the ROE pretty constant across asset classes? No. ROE is not constant at all across asset classes. In fact, ROE is not even constant depending on what you do with the finance. It changes depending on how you finance your deal and what you do with it, where you buy, what asset class you're in, what market you're in, it varies widely, huge variation, depending on how you do your deal, all kinds of different elements. That's really what you're solving for, is you should be focused on ROE over time. To me, that's more important than anything else. 
people get caught up in all these other technical things and what's going in here and is this stadium happening there and I'm going to a red state and there's population growth there and there's rent control in LA and that's all bad it's not what that's a that's not what it's about it's about are we ever so if you can do this math and understand it and get a property that you feel like you can execute on you're gonna do well yes when the interest rates are high, yeah, six percent, and banks require a larger down payment. Are there ever like third party lenders that try to undercut banks that can afford it to say like get a five percent interest or something? Undercut, no. Overcut, yes. Uh, so the. The capital markets are a fascinating, huge section of the industry. If you're interested in, in finance and in debt, many millions have been made placing debt and lending debt as well. Um, and the answer to your question is yes, but not exactly. So uh, your typical lender varies depending on what property type you're buying and size. For your, your average one to four unit purchase, you're going to do a regular government sponsored enterprise backed residential loan. So you'll you'll go to like your mortgage lender, rocket mortgage, whatever, right? And they'll originate your loan and they will usually sell it and it's backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Those are usually 30 year fixed money. They're kind of heavily regulated, guaranteed by the government, all that kind of stuff. For commercial real estate, it, these loans are typically held on the bank's balance sheets, uh, which is getting us in trouble right now a little bit. And so the banks will loan that money themselves. But like we mentioned, like the climate's weird right now and to your question, right? Some lenders aren't lending at all. Enter other sources of debt. So you have private lenders, which are very common. Those sometimes are individuals, family offices, or even debt funds. You can make an entire career out of raising private debt funds from individual investors that want to put 50 grand a pop in. But the rate's going to be subject to the risk that they see in the deal getting into. It. So, you know, you call that... Hard money or private debt is what you call that. So like, let's say you need high leverage on your deal because a bank will only loan you 50%, but you believe in the deal and you want 70% and I know I can perform on the deal. I want 70%. You can go out to that private market and where a bank might lend you 6.5% with 50% LTV. A private lender or hard money lender might lend you 70% LTV, but they're probably going to charge you 11%. They're probably going to charge you two to four points and your loan is probably due in 18 months, maybe 24 so that's a hardcore, aggressive way to do it. But what can you do when you do that? More leverage, more juice, higher returns, but more risk. So if you want to do like a value add deal where you're you're going to, you know, build some units on the property and you're going to clean it up and do a whole bunch of improvements and you want to borrow that too, you can do all that. But it's more risky to use more leverage. Great question. And you have loans like CMBS loans, which is packaged commercial paper, basically by big buildings. You got all kinds of different players in the debt space. Life insurance companies make loans. You know, private equity companies are in the lending space, and the loans themselves get bought and resold on the secondary market too. Sometimes for people that like to loan to own, so you have to watch out for those people. That's what we used to call loan shark. Uh, so leverage. This is this is. You have to understand the trade-off between leverage and cash flow and what it can do for your returns. Other questions on this? This is probably like the thing that makes you rich in real estate. Nope. Cool. All right, so we, we talked about this on the board already. Basic commercial loan underwriting. Uh, we want a 1.2 debt coverage ratio or higher. I think we covered that. And now I have my case study to put it into action. We're about halfway through. You guys wanna take a break? Come back to it, build it. Let's do that. Uh, let's take 10 minutes-ish and come back at 2.45. So this will be extension. So we'll just work it by share and ask plug it in. Uh right here we're just gonna pass it Yeah, I'll get out by all checking the scene already. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you send it? Interesting. I was bad. Yeah. Thanks, but uh, 
Or just like oh, okay. Yeah, they like it was like it's not. I guess you could just log in. It's log in here. Then you know where you go with all this. Yeah, <laughs> 
All right, it's two forty five. Well, let's do it. Okay, so uh, we have a little case study property here. <laughs> This is a six unit apartment building in Long Beach. Beautiful, 500 St. Louis. This is mine, so I call it. Uh, we're gonna say that it's for sale for 1.5 million bucks. It's about 3,500 square feet. It's uh, six one bedroom, one bath units. So kind of just small, medium size. Normal apartment building, you see a million of these all over LA, built in the 40s. Nothing special, but I've reminded it a little bit you know, over the years. Um, its gross scheduled income is 107.424, right? So we have our first metric that we need to figure out if I'm trying to rip you off or not on this deal. And what we're going to do is we're going to mess with the financing, play with the numbers a little bit. I've got a very simple Excel sheet that um, I'll open up in a second, and we will decide if this looks like a decent deal or not. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if okay, we're gonna come back. So we'll decide, we'll talk about how to value this and then, then we'll open it up. So uh, with valuing any property, there's three approaches to value. You have your income approach, the sales comparison approach, and the cost approach. Um, the method that most people are used to hearing about, if you've like watched a lot of reality TV and looked at Zillow and stuff like that, is the sales comparison approach. <clears throat> that method is typically used for houses. So we're probably used to doing that if we're if you've ever poked around at rental houses, flips, that kind of thing. And the way that that works is you compare different comparable sales to your subject, your subject being the property that you're trying to analyze or value, this is what appraisers do. And you compare them based on location, condition, and size. What that typically boils down to at the end of the day is price per square foot, right? So we can say based on the location, in Westchester of a 2,000 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, single family home that's been renovated. What's the going price per square foot for that property? All other things being equal, if we have some other comps like that in the same neighborhood of Westchester, so let's say north of Manchester, right by campus, we'll get a pretty good idea of what that property is worth. <laughs> that's basically what Zillow is doing. When you open up their estimate, they're just pulling the comps because they pull from MLS and they're spitting out a number kind of based on price per square foot for the most part, based on the comparable sales around whatever property you might be looking at. And that's how you um, figure out value on a single family. It'll be worth less if it's not as updated. It'll be worth less if it's in a slightly less desirable location. Obviously it's worth less if it's smaller and so on, right? But that's a pretty easy method to value properties. Um, interestingly, because of the uh, because of the way that the debt works with multifamily, we use the same approach for appraising properties up to four units. A one to four unit loan, a loan on a one to four unit property, or like I said, those thirty year fixed loans generally they're uh, guaranteed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, with some exceptions. You can get other loans on those types of properties too, but because that's the prevalent loan for those types of properties. Appraisers use the sales comparison method to value those properties. 
Is there a problem with that from our standpoint if we're looking at two to four unit apartment buildings? Can you guys think of a problem with that methodology? Maybe that it has nothing to do with the income, right? People, are, even if you're buying a two to four unit property for an investment property, you're still buying it for the income. You're not buying it because of the pretty tile in the kitchen and the flowers, right? You're buying it because of the income. So it gets problematic with financing those deals sometimes. You'll buy, investors will buy those deals based on these metrics. And then you go to finance the deal and the appraiser will have a completely different opinion than you did because they're doing that. So whenever you're, if, you, if you're investing in two to four unit properties, and I'm not saying don't because they're a great place to start, you have to use price per square foot in your analysis of value along with GRM and cap rate because the appraiser sure will. And if you go to resell it later or refinance it later or something like that, you could have an issue. So I've seen that on buildings where like they're really cranking on income, they get amazing rents, but they're small or something like that. And the price per square foot for what you think you should be able to charge based on the market cap rate of the market GRM is way higher. You get a problem on a refi or a problem on a sale sometimes. So there's this weird disconnect in the market that we see there. Just something to be aware of, kind of a tidbit. Then you have the income approach. So the income approach, you, you still pick the same comps that are as similar as possible. So for this six unit building, we would try and find, uh, you know, older apartment buildings in Long Beach, small, ideally of the similar size, maybe remodeled, but you know, of that vintage. And, but instead of comparing them on like condition and size, we'll compare them based on the income they make. So then we use NOI, we use cap rate and GRM after we've calculated the NOI to compare the buildings to each other and decide what the correct market price is for our subject. So you could say the going GRM in Long Beach is 15. And we could decide that's it, then if your subject is a good deal or not, right? By looking at comps. This is the way all commercial real estate is valued for the most part. So apartment buildings, industrial, office, retail, it's all income approach based on cap rates. It just depends on which asset class area and you know type of building that you're in. The, um, the cap rate is going to vary widely. But like I said earlier, the nice thing about cap rates is they kind of allow you to compare asset classes to each other and what they should be going for. Um, you'll typically see that research come from like CoStar is the most common source, very expensive data service, but um, commercial brokers usually have access to that and can send market reports and stuff like that to you. This is, this is by far the most useful approach an investor will use to value property because at the end of the day, we're buying them for the income. So it makes sense that the value is derived from the income. But the other great thing about that is that means if you control the income, you control the value. That's what's really nice about commercial instead of residential. With residential, it's that price per square foot. How does it compare? It's kind of a subjective emotional thing. Now with commercial, it's what are investors willing to pay on a cap rate in that area? The third one, we don't use it much is the cost approach. Um, and that's kind of like a, a reconstruction cost, uh, price estimated based on the cost to build, buy the land and rebuild the building. And then you would depreciate it based on uh, the age of the property. That's That method is really only used when you've got like a weird building that doesn't have any comps for it. Um, so I don't know, like a, maybe a school or a church or like a marina, you know, or I don't know, a country club, something weird that you can't really, there's not going to be comps for it. You might use the cost approach um, or you'd use it more in a taxation um, for a taxation use. We don't see that a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you mind repeating one more time what, who uses the sales comparison approach and the income approach? To yeah. So the sales comparison approach is primarily used for residential lending. So that's one to four unit residential properties. So houses and small apartment buildings up to four units use the sales comparison approach. The appraisers will still put the income approach in their report, but they'll ignore it. They'll use this. And that's mainly because like Fannie and Freddie make it. And then the income approach is used for all other uh, types of commercial real estate. Even land um, in a lot of cases uses the income approach. Like the way we value land is, okay, what can you build on it? What's it worth after we build it? 
and how much does it cost us to build it? And what do developers expect for profit in that area? At the end, you're really kind of using the income approach still to do land. Um, so income approach is by far the most important one to understand. That's really probably what we're gonna mess around with the most on our example, but we always look at price per square foot too, because it's indicative of, you know, whether you're getting a good deal or not, even if you don't use it that way. Yes. Yeah, the cost approach is is more often used for properties that are where there are not very many comps available. So you, you have the land and you have some weird structure on it or something that there's just not very many of. That's where you would see the cost approach used. Yeah, I don't see it much. You'll see it in appraisals though, and you'll definitely see it in taxation for taxation purposes. Uh, so uh, let's talk about cap rates. So I mentioned this earlier. I want to talk about it again because cap rates is, you'll just hear about cap rates all day long. If you're interested in investment real estate, commercial real estate, this is the buzzword and they're really easy to misunderstand. The math is simple, right? We have the math right here, very easy. There it is at the bottom of the slide again. But what does it really mean? Uh, I just want to reiterate that a bit for everybody. So, you know, yes, they're an expression of, Cash flow. Yes, I agree. That's where most people stop. Because they say, oh, cap rate means your cash flow. So higher cap rate, higher cash flow equals good. So I want the highest cap rate I could possibly find. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but really, what they are is they're a market expression of value based on other investors' interpretation of the risk for investing in that property, in that market, for that asset class. So another way to look at it is, it's, we know it's a yield, right? It's a percentage return. It's a cash yield, like a bond yield or money in a savings account. But the yield varies widely, widely. It's the yield that investors are willing to accept for their invested capital in that property type, in that market, in that condition. So think about that in terms of like the debt as, as a good analogy. If you've looked at bond investing, government bonds are gonna be your lowest possible yield, right? Because they're basically risk-free. We use treasury rates as our risk-free rate in finance. Because as you're, usually you're definitely gonna get paid back these days, who knows, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then you have junk bonds, right? Companies that issue bonds, but they're, they're a big credit risk and you're gonna get a super high yield for the junk bond but they might default, you might not get your money done. Cap rate is the same thing. So for people that go on LoopNet, that's the free investment commercial real estate platform like Zillow, go on LoopNet, you can sort by cap rates and find the highest cap rate you can possibly find. You are actually finding the most risky deal you can possibly find. And the same thing can be said for markets. So the going cap rate in LA, I think right now, CoStar says it's 5.1%. And the going cap rate in, I don't know, uh, I'll pick on Minneapolis because that's where I'm from. I'm guessing it's seven because Minneapolis has had some struggles, right? Or some of these other markets with lots of supply or maybe a North Dakota somewhere where there's not, there's only one industry and when the oil's not going well, nobody's in North Dakota anymore and when it's going well, it's going really well, right? It's a risky market to be in. So cap rates in North Dakota are gonna be way, way higher than Los Angeles, and they should be, because investors need a higher yield in order to be enticed to invest their capital in North Dakota. So I wanted you to understand that that's what it's about. So if we know properties NOI, and we know the market cap rate for that area, we know the property's value, because we can divide it. If you take the market cap rate, the NOI, divided by the market cap rate, you have the value. Very simple, right? We can reverse this around and we can say, if we know this property makes 65,000, the market cap rate is 4.3, we can divide 4.3 and 65,000, that equals 1.5 million, we have our value. So you need to know your market cap rates. That being said, it's not as simple as saying, well, yeah, but the cap rate in Los Angeles is 5.1, so that's what I'm gonna pay. You know, obviously that's different depending on every neighborhood in Los Angeles. And we have 120 year old buildings in Los Angeles and we have brand new buildings in Los Angeles and you probably won't pay the same cap rate for those two. So, Really, when you do the actual analysis, you're going to go try and find the most similar comps, do the cap rate analysis on each of the comps, compare them to each other, and then arrive at what value you might be willing to pay. Does that make sense? 
cap rates are kind of a thing with commercial real estate. Cool. All right. So um, this is our own research. Our company, uh, quite a few LMU interns for that matter, help us with our own market research. Uh, and we do research on these cities every quarter. Uh, this is from about the airport, Inglewood down through Long Beach. Uh, this is kind of hard to read, but if you go to our website, uh, buckinghaminvestments.com and you go to the market research dashboard, it's in, um, I forgot where it's in. It's, I think it's in plan, the plan section. You'll find it. You have uh, this whole table and graph set that you can filter as much as you want. So you can go two to four unit properties only or five and up, or you can go down to zip code, neighborhood, city, you know, uh, time span, whatever you want. And it spits out all of our own research. So we go through every single closed sale in the area and we correct all the errors in the listings because there usually are some. We eliminate the outliers and then we publish this on our website for free so that investors can uh, do their own research and see what stuff is going for. These numbers are going to be different from CoStar because they do their own research and their research is generally only focused on the five and up properties, whereas ours includes the smaller two to four unit properties. And their research also, all they do is call the brokers and ask what cap rates they went for. So their research doesn't have as much income information as ours does. Um, they're not allowed to use the MLS data because they're a competitor of the MLS, whereas our licensing with the MLS allows us to use all that. So I'd like to think ours is more accurate. Uh, but uh, it's, it's actually really interesting stuff. So this is from uh, quite a while ago. Let's see, 500. This is probably actually over a full year. And this is probably like three years ago because it's a super high GRM. But you can see where... Um, all the sales fall. We have a ton in Long Beach because it's just a dense, big city. There's a lot more apartment buildings there. Handful in Inglewood, Hawthorne, Gardena, uh, San Pedro, Torrance. And then what I really want to point out is this GRM and cap rate comparison. So Manhattan Beach, 30 sales, 77 units, 29 GRM is the, was the going GRM in Manhattan Beach. That's a 2.3 cap rate. Why would anybody ever buy that and borrow six and a half percent to buy a 2.3? But they do. They do. Because they think that appreciation in Manhattan Beach is going to be so extreme, it's worth it. More likely than not, they're buying all cash or mostly cash. Because it just doesn't make sense to me to buy anything in Manhattan Beach unless you're super rich already and you're just finding a place to store your money. Or maybe you've got a big value add in mind and you're going to buy it and resell or something. Uh, whereas Long Beach is 17 times gross or a 3.8% cap rate. Look, Hermosa the same, 26 and 2.5. Hawthorne, much more affordable, 4% cap rate. Harbor City, four and a half. El Segundo is a little more expensive at 3.14. Um, and you can see how the pricing varies based on the area. This is definitely like three years old at this point. So today, because interest rates have risen so much, Cap rates today are more like five and GRM's down like three full multiples. It's like 15, something like that now. So the market has gone down a lot. Uh, yeah, you can see at this point it was 485 a square foot. It's still up here near that on price per square foot. And how would that be possible? Why, how would the income metrics go down by the price per square foot is probably the same? Because the rents went up. So if the rents go up, you can actually continue to have appreciation on your property despite the valuation metrics deteriorating. So again, you know, coming back to finance, if you can get your rents up and you can do well there, you might still be able to, you know, refinance, keep your buildings and be in good shape. So this kind of makes sense seeing it in action, how those metrics work. Yeah. So just to clarify, so we want to see lower GRM, a lower number of GRM. Lower is better yeah. versus your comps, right? So what you would use this for is yeah, if you're going to go buy a building in Long Beach. Uh, you can filter for much, Long Beach is a huge city. So you probably filter for zip code. You probably filter for five and up versus two to four because those don't comp versus each other. Two to four unit properties are also more expensive than five and up always. Uh, but let's say for the sake of argument, you've got a deal and you've got it at 16 times gross. All of the things being equal, that's a good deal because our comps say uh, 500 sales in Long Beach, the average GRM was 17.6. So the lower the better. Okay. And you want a higher cap rate. So that if the cap rate was 3.8 and you got a four and a half, it, it might be a good deal. So it's like that's pretty extreme, right? It's very extreme. Yeah, that's like Beverly Hills, yeah, yeah Newport Beach, 
Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Hey guys, how's it going? All right, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So is there a reason why our free kidney traits are? Yeah, it, there is. So great question. So this is a snapshot in time. Oh my. There are appreciation. The rate of appreciation isn't above it, but if you go to the website and you look at the graphs that are above the table on whatever your data set is, it will show you the values over time. So it will show you the appreciation. It'll show you price per square foot. We, we bring this out quarterly. And I think we have this graphical interface going back to 2013 now, 11 years. Our older data goes back to uh, the 1960s. But um, so you will see the appreciation in the charts above this if you go to our website. I don't think this uh, representation of it calculates the appreciation rate, but it'll sh you'll be able to because it'll show you what the price per square foot looks like. Uh, but this is just a snapshot in time. So the table itself is, uh, this looks like a year's worth of data to me. And I'm guessing this is probably 2021 based on when I made this presentation, maybe 2020. Uh, and also based on how much lower the values are today. Um, this is probably all the sales in 2021. So it's most likely this. So just for that data set, this is just a snapshot of that time. But do you not do appreciation? No, we do it yearly. Yeah, we look at it that way. That's just how it spits out here on this table. Um, the graph, it will show you annually. And then when I'm doing my modeling on a property and how it might look in the future, I use an annual appreciation rate of whatever I think is reasonable for that property. I usually just use 5%. Even though that, that long-term average is 65 I try and stay conservative and use 5%. It's going down right now. But it, you know, again, if you have that long-term mindset, you can use long-term math to kind of model out your returns and some years you're going to beat it, some years you won't, but over a long enough time period, it will probably converge on that average. Does that kind of make sense how you would use this? This is basically a giant comp set available for you for free if you want to look at builders. <clears throat> Pretty interesting stuff. That's, that's how you put all this into use. Now you understand how this works? This is that in real life. Okay, so knowing that <clears throat> Long Beach is 17.6 times gross and 3.8% cap rate, do we buy it? I'm not sure. Shall we find out? Let's do the math. So do you remember we had um, our little gross scheduled income? What was it? Like 107 something? 107.424. Everybody see that? Yeah? All right. So let's start here. All you have to do is start entering your numbers in. And now we understand the math on the board. So I'm going to assume everybody knows some basic Excel formula entry. You can duplicate this if you want. I have a much, much more complicated sheet I used to underwrite purchases that I make and our clients make. Uh, and then we have a vacancy allowance. <laughs> what do you think a good vacancy allowance to use it? What's the vacancy rate? Six percent. Yeah, that's pretty good. Banks will probably use five. The vacancy rate in LA is about five percent right now. So I'm going to do equals 0 0.05 times our gross scheduled rents. <clears throat> we got to make it negative. There's our vacancy. What about other income? Uh, this building has three garages in the back. Mm -hmm. Should we say 100 bucks a garage? Sure. 3,600 bucks, right? Where these are all annual. All right. So that's our effective gross income. So we have our gross scheduled rents minus our vacancy allowance plus other income. Uh, that equals effective gross income. And now uh, for our expenses. So that's for property taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, uh, utilities, repairs. Did we say, what did we say a good number was for that? Like 35%? I think so. I don't expect you to know that. But yes, <laughs> in the market, 35% is pretty normal. Oops, I forgot my equals. Okay. Expenses are 36,978 estimated. So our NLI on this property is 68,000 and change. Okay. Should we figure out some loan terms? 
How much do we want to borrow to buy this puppy? 40%. Now you want to maximize your leverage. 80. 80. Let's get 80. Let's go get it. Come on. O OPM, right? Other people's money. Max, you got a five times leverage factor there. Okay. Now we're talking. All right. So it's 1.5 million. And we're going to borrow 80% of that. What is that? 800,000 and 800,000. 116. 116. 116. And 20% of the 100,000. And we want to borrow 80%. 1.2. 1.2. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> and our interest rate is 6.5. Amortized over 30 years. All right. So our mortgage payment is $75.85. And that didn't give me anything. <clears throat> That's hilarious. Look at that. The formula's right. Let's try it again. Okay. Awesome. What do we think about this deal at 80%? Yeah. Look good? Not at all. No. No. You're losing money. You're losing, money. <clears throat> you are losing $22,000 a year for the privilege of owning this building. Great deal. Right? No. <clears throat> In fact, is this deal even possible? The bank probably would give you 80%. Correct. Right? That's the answer I was looking for. The bank won't, why won't the bank give you 80%? Because they could do this math too. They could do this math too, and they're doing that math right there. Right? Do you remember most commercial loan programs require the debt coverage ratio to be greater than or equal to 1.2? So, what do we have to do to make the deal work? Put more cash down and borrow less money. Put more cash down, borrow less. Let's try that first. Okay. What if we only borrow 750? How about that? Coincidence? I think not. It works with 50% down. Just like we said, most deals work these days with 50% down, right? All of a sudden your debt coverage ratio is 1.2, 6.5% debt, same price, we're borrowing half. It makes 11,788. Yes, let's say you. Borrow like 55 to 60 percent, and your debt coverage ratio is like 1.15 or something. Would the bank still approve that, or is that like a hard cap? Like, one hard no, okay, they will force you to put this much down. Okay, so you can both give borrow it on something else. That's you can borrow it uh, against another property or a line of credit or whatever. They usually don't care about that. Uh, but on the property, the first position purchase loan itself, no deal. Okay, so um, is this a good deal now? Yeah. Do we know that? Well, it's called cake out. So. I mean, that's cool. That's, that's good. That, How do our returns look? Great deal. Uh, yeah, I mean. But if appreciation is good, it's a good deal. Yeah. Right? So the GRM is 14. If we assume Long Beach is still at 17.6, yeah, it's, it's a good deal, right? We got a better deal on the GRM than the average. And we got a better cap rate than the average because it was at like 3.8, right? So this was a good deal. The problem is, is my numbers were from like three years ago. Yeah. So in reality, um, this property is probably, the going GRM now is probably 12 in this area. So you might need to work down that, that greedy owner. We'll see what happens here. So if we lower it to 1.3, See how I do that math? I know I'm at around 100,000, so very easy to take it down to 12 times gross. Now we know if the market deteriorated, it's worth 12 times gross because the debt's this high. We got a much better deal on it now, um, but the income's the same and the loan amount's the same, but now we only put 50, 550,000 down. So what just happened? we suddenly qualified for a higher LTV. You see that? 
So because we lowered the price, we didn't change the loan amount. And you'll notice the debt coverage ratio didn't change because the income statement didn't change. But we put less of our own money into the deal. So none of the metrics that the bank has, they don't care about that. They don't care about this. About we, we got a great deal on it. They don't care. But they'll still loan the same amount. But now what did change? Our cap rate got better. Our GRM got better. And our cash on cash return improved too because our equity to the deal is less. Yes. How would you go about negotiating? Yeah. I mean, the best way to negotiate it is to point to the comps. So, you know, in reality, if we were to go to our website today and like do five and up only in this neighborhood, you'd probably see the comps are trading at 12 times gross. I was using old data. Um, and that's the best argument is that your building is worth 12 times gross. Sellers don't tend to care about the financing unless it affects the whole rest of the market. Like if you call a seller and you say, well, I, I you know, your building's a bad deal because I have to put 50% down. They're gonna be like, yeah, so that sounds like you problem, you know? <laughs> but when everybody has to put a 50% down, that's a them problem. <laughs> and so that's what you're experiencing right now in the market is sellers are slowly coming to the realization that the party is over. Uh, as far as the free money goes. And so that's why values have done this. When I wrote this um, presentation, this is actually an interesting little study, not even that long ago. I think this was two years ago we started doing these. Uh, when I wrote this, this was priced perfectly. This is well, a one and a half million dollar building. And now it's it's worth $200,000 less. Now it's worth 1.3. Luckily, I think if I look at my actual rent roll, my rents are way up. So I think my, in real life, I think my building value has stayed about flat but it's probably still only worth 12 times gross now, whereas it would have appreciated a lot more had the market done different things. Um, what else could we do to make it work better? Let's say that greedy seller will only reduce to 1.4 <clears throat> and we just don't have, we just can't do it, right? Um, we don't have the, the 650 to put down. What else could we do? We need to get a loan for 850. We only have the 550 to put down. So we were really hoping they were gonna take our offer at 1.3, but they didn't. We could attempt to negotiate the rates, right? Now the, the bank's not, not gonna do that. But let's say over time, at the end of this year, we've had a few rate decreases. You know, we've got some bank failures out of the way and rates spreads have come down and we're at five and a half percent debt, what happens? Okay, we're, we're pretty much there. I'm just gonna say we're there, same difference, right? We're gonna put a couple more bucks down, we'll be fine. We'll check the couch cushions. So <laughs> that's the impact of rates. You can put more down, deal works. You can get a better rate, deal works. You can get a better price, deal works. These different levers you can pull and they all affect how, how the numbers perform, right? So at this point now, the GRM is still 13. We might still be overpaying on a market basis though, if, if the going GRM is 12. But if you think about it, if the market kind of generally moves together, if rates come down to five and a half, I'm not, they don't move you know, uh, directly correlated, but it's actually kind of likely that that value might come back up to a 13 multiple and this would sort of be the price that we're talking about. Just because it's easier to put capital in the market at a lower rent is yeah. more people are buying. Right. So the prices would go up. Yep. People bid it up that because the cost of funds is lower. Everything is about the cost of capital. Everything. Yeah. But it's not always that simple. Yeah. And, on a price, and, and that's why it's so different on a price per square foot basis. Like the really weird thing, if I go back to my, I wonder if I included this one. They didn't. I have a hilarious chart <clears throat> that zooms in on the 1970s uh, and it overlays the interest rate during this time period. So one thing about this chart that you don't see is this is not on a logarithmic scale. So you don't see the percentage change and, and it looks like the subprime boom and the one after it are way bigger than what's happened in the real estate market in the past. That's actually not true. The 1970s were, this was a way bigger boom than what we just experienced. You do the math, we started at $17 a square foot. 
1971 and in 1981 we were at $86 a square foot. That's a 406 percent increase. Whereas in '95 we were at 114, and 2007 we were at 329. That's like 200 and change, right? And in 2011 we were at 205, and we, we topped out at 518. That's like you know 200 and change. <laughs> this was almost twice as much appreciation in the 1970s, while interest rates went from like six percent to 18 during the same time period. So it's it's not necessary. I want you to understand that these these things are related, but it's not a one to one correlation. As the rate goes up, the values didn't go down inversely with that, because what's happened is at the same time, I can virtually guarantee rents shot up with it, because that was inflationary as well. Right. That's what happens in times of inflation. Inflation was way worse in the 1970s than it has been over the last few years here. So even though you know this was a difficult market because inflation was so wild, real estate investors made an absolute fortune. Can you imagine what happens if you apply that leverage factor to a 400% return on the value of property alone? If you bought a property with 25% down and then your market goes up by 400%, you just made 1,600% on your money. Crazy, right? So it's a perfect hedge against inflation. It's kind of wild how it all works together. So are we kind of understanding how things fit together now? Hopefully the spreadsheet helped a little bit on that. Cool. All right, uh, let's see, we did this. So we'll buy the building, but we'll buy it at 1.3 was the consensus, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so a uh, little bit of rubber meets the road here as far as how you do it. So we have an escrow process, due diligence and contract contingencies. So to actually buy a piece of property, it's more complicated than clicking a button on the computer. Uh, Zillow's trying with the failing at that. So are a bunch of other tech companies. Good luck. Uh, so when you buy a piece of property, you have to go through a lengthy process called escrow. And escrow is a way to make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do in the contract. So it's kind of a complicated thing to purchase. If you haven't bought a house before, it can be overwhelming. You have this purchase contract that uh, lays out everybody's responsibilities and it lays out your contract contingencies as a buyer, what you can do, and basically your escape clauses from a deal. And so kind of the process looks something like this. You offer back and forth, you get an agreed to price. Okay, we're buying the building for 1.3 million bucks. You put your earnest money deposit into a neutral third party escrow company. Um, they don't represent either the buyer or the seller. They hold the money. Uh, they kind of consummate the deal. They gather all the paperwork, the grantee, get the signatures. When it's ready to close and everything is done, they close the deal for you, title transfers. Um, They'll grab that 3% deposit. Typically, that's negotiable, but 3% is sort of our industry norm around here. So $1.3 million deal, $39,000 into escrow. That sits in escrow until uh, the deal is done, and then it counts towards the buyer's down payment. But if the buyer exercises any of their contingencies and needs to cancel, they get that money back. It's refundable. If they waive all their contingencies and they still fail to close, seller keeps it. That's generally how it works. So during the escrow, you have a due diligence period. Uh, pretty normal due diligence period in our area is 17 days. That's what's on the contract. That's basically to give you two weeks no matter where the weekends fall. Um, and during that time, the seller gives all the books and records to the buyer. So rent rolls, copy of leases, profit and loss, uh, statements that those, you know, we're trying to establish what the actual NOI of the property is. And we're doing our detailed underwriting on what we expect out of the cap rate. So we may find that the expense ratio looks worse or better. You'll also engage the lender at that point. The lender's doing the same due diligence because they're gonna loan on that 1.2 debt coverage ratio based on what they think the expenses are gonna be on a forward looking basis. <clears throat> you do your inspections, check the building out physically. Does it need a roof? Does it need electrical? Does it need plumbing? You know, Is there a bunch of beat up stuff in there that you have to renovate? All that fun stuff. You develop a budget perhaps. Uh, at this point, there's typically some additional negotiations. Uh, and so you might come back to the seller and say, hey, I liked your building at 1.3 with the stuff you sent me, but your you know, utility bills are double what you said they were in your marketing package. <clears throat> so the cap rate's not as good as I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to need a haircut on the price. Uh, or you could go back and you can say, we inspected the building. We went out two weeks ago when it was pouring rain and there was you know, water pouring into three of the units. 
and uh, it's going to need a roof. So I need a credit for like 25 grand for that roof. <clears throat> the seller could say, pal Sam, forget about it. And the buyer could say, okay, I don't want it anymore then. I'm going to cancel, exercise my contingency, and walk, get my deposit back, enjoy replacing that roof. Uh, or they could say, fine, fine, fine. I like the deal. It's a good area. I'll do the roof myself. Close. More likely what's going to happen is they will come to some sort of middle ground. We'll split the roof, you know, and the closest deal, you get a little credit towards closing. Once you're satisfied, you've got your loan approved, you got the appraisal, it came in at that 1.3 number, everything looks good. Bank's satisfied with that debt coverage ratio, your down payment looks good, they didn't retrade you on the rate, hopefully. Uh, you waive all your contingencies. So you sign something saying, yep, I'm good, my deposit's non-refundable, I intend on closing. And you get everything uh, buttoned up paperwork-wise, get insurance, which is really rough these days. Um, you sign your loan docs, put the rest of your down payment to that 550000 into escrow. And then the lender funds, they record the grantee to the county office, title company issues the title policy, and you own the building. That's yours. Congratulations. That's how it works. That typically takes, this whole process usually takes about 30 days for a one to four unit purchase and 60 days for a five unit and above purchase. Yeah. Why is insurance so much better than that? We can talk for hours about that too, but um, the insurance market is all messed up right now across the whole country. Insurance companies have taken huge losses uh, from a combination of things. Um, a lot of it's inflation. So construction costs have absolutely ballooned post-pandemic, which originally was as a result of all the supply chain snarls and stuff like that, but it's also a result of the labor shortage. Materials are expensive all those issues and it, so claim their claim payments have ballooned um, but also it's been a very litigious environment over the last few years and when tenants sue insurance companies tend to pay uh, there's been a lot of extreme weather events that have hit them very hard um, all kinds of stuff. but insurance companies have paid out huge claims over the past few years and as a result they've needed to raise premiums by a ton but what happens is this, especially in california the Department of Insurance hasn't allowed them to raise rates as much as they would have liked to. So they're in this game of chicken and a lot of the insurance companies have exited the state completely. So it's very difficult even to find insurance sometimes depending on the condition of your building. Uh, and, and when you do, it can be from sort of like a third tier carrier and it's like three times as expensive as you thought it was gonna be. Uh, very, very challenging insurance market. It's not just California, the, you know, the cost issues and stuff, it's the whole country. So do some people just uh, buy insurance? Not a choice if you use financing. Your lender will force you to have insurance. But what it does do is guess who gets a hold of your insurance policy? Your lender. And guess what impacts your NOI? Your insurance premium. And what impacts the debt coverage ratio? Your insurance premium. So you know if you can't find insurance for the price that you were expecting to when you originally underwrote the deal, it's possible that not only could your insurance be expensive, but you could also be required to put hundreds of thousands of dollars additional down in order to buy the building and close the deal. So you wanna be shopping for insurance before this, because that's another valid reason to go back to the seller and say, hey, my numbers were all wrong. Your building's in crap condition. Uh, it's gonna cost me three times as much to insure it as I thought. So I need more money off. And they could say no, and you could say, okay, bye. Or they could say yes. It's a mess, it's a total mess. It's hitting car, car insurance too, but homeowners especially bad. This is just kind of a sample list of due diligence. I rattle all this stuff off, but what due diligence is, is the same thing when you buy a company as it is when you buy a property. Much easier when you buy a property because there's not much to it. But you're reviewing all of the books and records regarding the property. Like I said, leases, expenses, contracts, uh, property taxes, insurance, uh, you know, claims, tenant collections issues, evictions, major capital improvements, you review permits if you can find them, uh, all kinds of stuff. So this is sort of our standard list of due diligence items that we go through when we're conducting due diligence. That's sort of like the soft due diligence. And then you have the physical hard due diligence, which would be all your inspections. So we'll do a physical inspection, general inspection of the building. We usually do a sewer cam inspection of the building, look at the sewer line, um, and then often a termite inspection. And then if you identify issues in any of the major systems, 
roof, plumbing, electrical foundation, you might bring out a specialty uh, tradesperson to look at any of those things too. Huge list. Uh, the top few bits here are the most important. Leases, rent roll, and uh, P&Ls are going to be the big one. And you use the historicals to update your little Excel model, right? And decide if you still like the deal, if the lender still likes the deal, and if you're going to move forward. And then there's your contingencies. So I kind of mentioned it as a general catch-all before, but you really have kind of three main contingencies. You have your investigation contingency, which is um, the main one that allows you to cancel basically for no reason or any reason. And that's typically 17 days. During that time, that's when you're doing all those inspections, you're reviewing all the books and records, you're asking follow-up questions, you're probably going to the city and looking at permits, maybe you're bringing contractors, you're developing budgets, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. You also have your appraisal contingency. That says if the property doesn't appraise for your contract price, you can walk and get your deposit back. So if it only appraises for, let's say, 1.25 million in our deal, you don't have to move forward with it. You can cancel and say, sorry, we are 1.3. Uh, it's appraised for 1.25. I'm only willing to pay 1.25. Or what's more likely that you'll do is you'll say, it appraised for 1.25. I'll have it for 1.25, please. And the seller can say yes or no. If they say no, you can walk. If they say yes, congratulations, you've got another discount. Typically, again, what happens is, well, let's put the difference with you. Put a little more down, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, this is how these things go. <laughs> Once you get your appraisal back, if it looks good, you waive that. One important thing is with commercial, the lender's going to use the appraiser's expenses to calculate the debt coverage ratio. So it's not your choice what they're going to do. They're going to get the same documentation from the seller. The appraiser's going to do their own math. If there's, say, like something totally missing, like the seller sends you their P&Ls and well, yeah, but I pay my utilities with my own credit card for the points. And that's not in the property management report. report. The lender is going to add the utilities and try and get the bills or estimate that. You're not just going to like not be able to show up. Right? So they do their own underwriting to size the loan. Uh, and then the loan contingencies basically says if your loan described in the contract is not approved, you can cancel as well. 21 days is typical for that on smaller deals, longer with bigger deals. Um, and you get your deposit back there too. So once you have your loan approval, full commitment, you sign that away as well. Now you sign all these away, your deposit is non-refundable, you move to closing, everything's great. Make sense? Questions on contingencies? Cool. That's pretty much it. If you want to do further reading on all this stuff, uh, we have some of these are free downloads on our site. It's not marketing material, it's actually educational. We have our original real estate investment principles guide. It's about 30 pages long. It, it uh, kind of a recap of a lot of stuff we talked about today. It was written by Jack Buckingham, our founder in 1971, and nothing has changed, honestly. That's the cool thing about real estate. One of the oldest businesses in the world. People need space, as it turns out. So uh, that's a good one. That got me interested in this to begin with. It's a quick read. We have a planning guide in there too, if you want to get really crazy and uh, go nuts on a detailed plan. And then um, those uh, market studies are all in that market research dashboard. If you want to manipulate and play around with that, that's kind of fun. And then um, our one of our other founders, Marty Martin Stone wrote um, a handful of books. Probably the best one is the Unofficial Guide to Real Estate. That one's kind of famous. It, it's one. Of, it's on a bunch of like best-selling lists for real estate books. Uh, it's out of print now, but you can find it used pretty easily on Amazon if you want to get that. That's, I think, like a 300-page, much longer Bible type thing. It does have some stuff that was prevalent in 2003 regarding financing possibilities, which are definitely not possible anymore. <laughs> that was where you could go borrow 110% of the property's value with no job and no problem. Uh, and that you know, blew up the entire world economy for a while. So you can't do that anymore. But if you want to check it out, feel free. All right. So we got our QR codes, your attendance form, and CBA Advantage. And I believe when you scan your attendance form, you have to answer some questions, quiz questions. Hopefully, everybody got this. Number one, how do you calculate a cap rate? Number two, What's the debt coverage ratio used for? And number three, 
what is the income approach to value? So I'll give everybody a few minutes to take a gander at that and then maybe we'll pull the audience. Everyone pretty much set. Who wants to take a shot at number one? How do you calculate a cap rate? <laughs> yes, sir. Please NOI divided by a price. It might be sitting there on the board still. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you remember to check your notes. <laughs> How about number two? Yes, sir. Yes, the debt coverage ratio used by financial institutions to underwrite the loan and determine if and how much they will lend you. <clears throat> what about number three? What is the income approach to value? Ops, comparable properties, uh, compared uh, by cap rates. Yeah, yeah, comps as compared by cap rates to arrive at a value based on a building's income. Yep, valuation approach based on building's income basically. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, everybody good? Final questions, thoughts? I asked a lot. Where do you, sp how do you spend your days? Is you're, are you doing financial modeling all day and running numbers and things like that? Are you out at properties a lot? Is it all meeting with investors? All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. Um, I don't do as much of the analysis myself anymore. Right. Um, I wrote models to do that. Actually, my the model that we, the main model we used was originally my class project here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. yeah, real estate investing class. It's gone through some iterations since then. Right. It's a little slicker these days. But it was, it was an Excel file originally created here. Um, <clears throat> I've done it enough where, you know, I will eyeball a property and I just know, yeah. you know, and I'll usually get it out. I know based on the GRM is, is my favorite personally. This is the easiest. So what you see a lot on listings, like I look at deals, I do look at deals all day long, right. but you see listings where people advertise whatever cap rate. And you just have to keep in mind, sellers want to sell their building for as much as possible. And so does the listing broker. Right. So they're going to try and make the cap rate look potentially better than it actually is. Right. I don't know if that's ever happened before yet, <laughs> probably. Uh, but the GRM is very hard to fake. If the rents are wrong, you're out, you know, and you're gonna look at the leases and yeah. it's easy to verify. So, and I, I kind of know based on my experience how the properties are gonna perform. So that's my favorite metric, even with no rents. Like if I know a unit mix on a property, I at least know what I'm gonna get on the, on the GRM. So I'm kind of doing very quick analysis. But I have analysts at the office that do a lot of the heavy lifting right. in, in the spreadsheets and everything. Um, but I'm looking at them all the time, tracking the market. Uh, I'm meeting with investors all the time, talking about their portfolios. 
helping them. They don't look at this stuff every day like I do. So I'm trying to help them put the pieces together and understand what's going on with their portfolio, what options they might have to increase their returns. These days, helping people get out of trouble because there's people in trouble, um, making introductions to <clears throat> lenders, insurance brokers, architects, you know, contractors, ADU guys, right. whatever, um, doing a lot of strategic thought with them on things. Um, I teach multiple seminars and stuff like this a week. I, I ran a meeting this morning already at 7 a.m. too. Um, so this is probably my highest and best use. And then um, working with our salespeople, we have about 40 salespeople that come in and out at right. two. And so, you know, running our company meetings, helping with sales, Taught, you know, doing presentations, paying attention to where the market's going. Um, I definitely obsess over uh, business and market data. <clears throat> Listen to a lot of Bloomberg and stuff like that. Um, and then I'm at properties all the time too. Sometimes my own buildings, sometimes buildings I'm selling for clients. Yesterday was a property day. I, I have like two ADU construction projects going. So I was walking the construction projects. One of them's got some weird stuff going on with a sagging roof that's going to have a change order that we have to deal with. And got a lockout on another tenant that left a whole bunch of trash behind. So it's not glamorous, you know, but uh, stuff like that. Uh, a little bit of everything. That's, I, I really like it because it is and everything. That's a lot of more different stuff. Yeah, I'm not just cranking on Excel all day long. Right. Yeah, I'm not. And I'm not just. Um, interestingly, most people ask about brokerage because that's my, my, my day job is being a broker. I still work with clients of my own, although we have our company and our team. Um, and the traditional way you do brokerage is you come into a brokerage shop and you sit next to somebody who's a senior and they give you a giant list of properties in a zip code and you cold call those people till you're blue in the face. <clears throat> I've never done a cold call in my entire career. So uh, it doesn't have to be done that way. Some of our agents do it, but um, I've built my clientele off of meeting people through networking events, uh, teaching seminars and stuff and, and referrals and, and, and organic. But yes, a little bit of It's fun. It's a good job. It's been a good time. Anything else? Yes, sir. Are you uh, optimistic about interest rates? Yeah. Cautiously optimistic about interest rates. Every week is different. Like, if there's one thing you learn about markets, it's that everything's on sentiment. And this week was bad for sentiments because we got a hot CPI read on Monday or Tuesday. I forgot which one. I think it was Tuesday morning early. Everybody expected CPI to be at 2.9. It was at 3.1. Like, who cares, right? It's still coming down. It's not nine anymore like it was a year and a half ago. Uh, but the bond market reacted very negatively to that. And the 10 years back up at like four and a quarter plus right now. And so for us, the 10 year is the bellwether for where things are going. You've got to watch that. And we were below four um, towards the end of the year, beginning like January was like finally sigh of relief. The 10 year topped out over five, like 5.08 in like October or November. And it was absolute crickets back then. Nobody wanted to touch commercial real estate at all. Everybody just was waiting for the peak. And it's like now the consensus is the peak has passed us. So we are a lot busier all of a sudden this year because there's that general feeling that things are, are going to be coming down this year. <laughs> the bond market was initially pricing in three to six cuts, depending on who you ask, starting in March. That's definitely not happening at this point. Uh, we'll be lucky if we get our first cut in July, and we'll see. But I do think it's quite possible that rates will be 100 basis points lower by the end of the year, um, partly because elections. People like to do that. Powell probably wants to keep his job. Nobody likes to say that conspiracy theory out loud, but it tends to happen. Um, and, and I think the bank, uh, the lending situation hopefully will correct itself. An interesting thing is like typically commercial real estate debt is about 150 basis points spread above the 10 year. And so with the 10 year at four ish right now, rates should be in the mid fives, right? It should be five and a half at four, should be 575 right now at four and quarter. And it's at six and a half to like 6.75 right now. Um, so the spreads are at like 250 basis points, which is unusual. The reason that's happening right now is because all the lenders are worried about what's going on. They're worried about defaults in the office space like we talked about earlier. They're worried about their own balance sheet and, and their health. So we've had some bank failures last March, uh, First Republic and, you know, Signature and SVB and all that. We may be having some more bank failures this year. There's some 
rumblings that that's back in the mix. And the longer we keep rates higher, the more likely that is to happen. And so banks that are issuing new credit have widened their spreads to compensate for the additional risk that they see that they're taking on by extending credit. So I think it's likely that maybe not only the, the Fed funds rate could come down, but because um, you know we could have a 10-year treasury at the same level at the end of the year at four, but if banks got more comfortable with the lending environment and they lowered spreads, we could still be 100 basis points lower on rate without the 10-year moving. Uh, I'm hoping that's what happens. I get it 60 40. <laughs> I don't know. It's a great question. But I would I would say sentiment generally since the beginning of the year is better, but this week suddenly worse because of that. And then next week they'll be like, unemployment went up and everybody's like, why? Why? It's great. Yeah, the rates are coming down. It's like the best news ever when we're going to have a recession. It's like the worst thing. <laughs> Real estate feels all the pain on the early part of the recession. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming. I am available if you want to reach out to me by email. We do internships at our company too. I think we're full for the summer, but for next fall, we can start talking to people if you're interested and hope uh, you enjoy the rest of the real estate certificate seminars and see you at some of the events. Thanks. Thanks.